You bet. Welcome, everybody, to the June 18th, 2024 Board of Commissioners meeting. Please silence your cell phones and pagers and any other electronic communication devices. Agendas and speaker request forms are located at the back of the chambers. The Commission utilizes speaker request forms. If you would like to speak on any item, please complete a speaker request form located in the bookshelf in the back of the chambers and return to Commission Manager <coughs> Holly Hennies located at the lower right side of the dais. At this time, we're going to call the meeting to order, and I'd ask Commissioner Laster to do the moment of silence reflection, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Laster. Next on our agenda is review and approval of the agenda. Move so approved. Move. Second. <clears throat> Moved by Ross Connect and seconded by Laster to approve the agenda. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This brings us up to the consent agenda. And I'll recognize Commissioner Manager Holly Hennies. Good morning, Commissioners. For public notice, the Board of Commissioners uses a consent agenda to act on non controversial and routine items. The consent agenda <coughs> is acted upon by one motion and vote of the Board. Items are removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a board member or a citizen. Today's consent agenda contains the following items. Approval of the minutes from the regular meeting of June 5th, 2024. Number six is approval of the vouchers in the amount of $3,594,485.27. Number seven is to authorize the chair's signature to the order of organization and incorporation for the Cavern Road South Road District with the legal description as presented by the auditor. Number eight is to acknowledge disinternment permit number 1587557. Number nine is to reappoint Mr. Kevin Keene to the Planning Commission for a term of three years, effective July 1st, 2024. Number 10 is to accept the resignation of Mr. Kevin Burton from the Planning Commission, effective June 30th, 2024. Number 11 is to accept the recommendation for the appointment of Ms. Lori Litson and Mr. John Santana to the Planning Commission. Number 12 is to approve the abatement application for tax year 2023 for John Mack, parcel number 19792 in the amount of $972.74. Number 13 is to declare one risograph copier asset number 003678 and one sharp color copier ARBC3 asset number 005641 as surplus for the purpose of disposal as submitted by the Extension Office. Number 14 is to approve agreement 24-CS-11020300-039 with the Black Hills National Forest Service to chip seal the Pactola Reservoir boat ramps as submitted by the Highway Department. And finally, number 15 is to recognize and thank the volunteers for the month of May 2024. Thank you, Holly. At this time, is there any members of the public who wish to remove any items from the consent agenda? Seeing none, at this time, is there any commissioners who wish to remove any items from the consent agenda for further Mr. discussion? Sure. Mr. Ross. Number nine. Anybody else? I'd look for a motion to approve the consent agenda, agenda five through 15, with the exception of number nine. So moved. Second. Moved by Laster, seconded by uh, Drews. Any further discussion? None. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine, Mr. Ross. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see Kevin's here today, and I uh, got to visit with him earlier and uh, told him that I appreciated his past service, and then I'm glad that he's stepping up. I think it's another three years. Kevin, would you like to just uh, have a word? And... I don't have a lot of words. But no, I know, but uh, <laughs> you made the meeting, so you have an opportunity to speak. I just want to stop in and say... Um, uh, I enjoy uh, working on the Planning Commission, and I'm glad to uh, be able to help and looking forward to another three years. It's uh, a lot of interesting things going on in Pennington County, and uh, it's fun to be part of that. So, again, I thank you. Thank you for your service. Yeah. 
Thank you, Kevin. And you've got a couple new members coming on, well, one past member, but we appreciate your service and, and perseverance for being on the commission. Thank you. Mr. Chair, move to approve number nine. Sorry. Moved by Roskinek, seconded by Drews to approve reappointment of Kevin Goon to the Planning Commission for another three years, effective July 1st. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, that brings us up to item number 16. Uh, commissioners, good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Fire Commissioner Ross Connect, and distinguished members of the Commission, agency representatives, and fire chiefs, I'd like to also recognize uh, Sheriff Mueller in this discussion today. Uh, today's presentation by the Rapid Valley Volunteer Fire Chief Joe Jaden is in reference to Occupational Safety and Health Administration Notice of Proposed Rulemaking uh, Emergency Response Standard. It is currently moving through the federal rulemaking process, not through Congress. I'd like to emphasize that the Pinion County Fire Service is not fighting OSHA on the benefits of safety. Your fire service commissioners is expressing concern about the proposed standards, infeasibility, and one-size-fits-all approach. There are currently 29 OSHA plan states, including Wyoming, Iowa, and Minnesota. And currently there's an OSHA office in Sioux Falls. Commissioner Drews did ask the question. I'm under the presumption that OSHA does not apply to government entities, including Pennington County, and would this change our status with other OSHA regulations? I know Chief Jaden will get more into this, but the concern that has been expressed to us is under South Dakota Codified Law 621-5. Volunteer firefighters and rescue squad members, such as our search and rescue members, are considered employees of the county. Nonprofits, all 20 of our fire departments in Pennington County are not-for-profit organizations and may fall within the scope of this rule, even if uh, they are in states or in South Dakota that is not an OSHA pl uh, plan state. This could eventually impact South Dakota through pressure to the South Dakota Department of Labor. We know that's already been discussed, as has happened in other states. And we generally don't bring anything to you like this unless we're very serious about it. I have six uh, fire chiefs and agency representatives in the audience today. The other thing that uh, Commissioner Ross, or Drews asked us, would this change our, our status with other OSHA regulations? Commissioner Drews, I don't have the answer for you on this. This is an incredibly complex issue that's going on, and time is really needed for our legal counsel to review and advise on this. As I turn this presentation over to Chief Jaden, I'll close with this introduction, the introduction with this. The current standard is focused on industrial fire brigades. A good example of that is Boeing having its own in-plant fire brigade, those kind of situations. It's 40 pages. If this was to go through and become law as it is currently written, the standard would go to 608 pages. OSHA's own summary of the document is 250 pages. By incorporating by reference the standards and law would be in excess of 3,000 pages including 1,500 plus shalls and musts. Uh, the National Volunteer Fire Council summary alone is over 14 pages. OSHA is referencing and believes that the average volunteer fire department budget in the United States is $1.7 million annually. They reference that. 33% of our fire departments in Pena County have no recognized mean of annual sources of sustainable funding. And one of the sources of the data that OSHA has referenced is from a privately held magazine, which is just amazing to me that a federal agency would reference something like that. How it is written now, the standard would affect your firefighters, law enforcement teams, such as your water rescue team and other specialty teams under Sheriff Mueller, our search and rescue team, ambulance services, and other EMS providers. It's a very serious issue. Uh, we have a, had a very limited window of opportunity to even look at it and get any information put together on it. And I'll ask Chief Jaden to come up and give you some more details on it. We have some other fire chiefs here in attendance or agency reps who can help you answer any questions. Thanks, sir. 
Good morning. Uh, thank you all for taking a, taking a minute or two to listen to what we have to say. Just recognize yourself for the record. I'm sorry. My first, first name is Joe and last name is Jaden. It's spelled T-J-A-D-E-N, just because some Norwegians decided to spell it different than what should be on most, most IDs. Um, where, we're go where we want to come to you folks with is we're looking at this new fire brigade issue uh, that has come up from OSHA and people have a, a known issue with understanding where OSHA has a little bit more overreach in what they think. Uh, first thing we want to say is we really don't feel that this is an overreach. We think that this is just coming too fast for us as fire, fire as the fire departments and so on to catch on to. Uh, just a quick background. Um, Jerome mentioned that this was actually called titled the Fire Brigade Standard from OSHA. It was actually written in 1980. Uh, since then, it has not been visited until just this last, since until 2001 after 9-11. They actually wanted to look at something. So this has actually been many years in the process. It's actually taken 17 years for OSHA to write this uh, by the time they actually got everything under under uh, way. It was first printed off February 5th of this year in the Federal Register. Uh, the original date for the end of question was May 6th, has been since extended to June 20, or July 22nd. And with those dates in mind, what we're looking at doing, what the fire service in general has been looking at doing, is trying to clarify the statements inside this. Uh, what we're going to get into with, with some of the background on this is where these where the concerns lie. All right, so starting off, the the standard as it sits, or the regulate, proposed regulation as it sits, actually has several good things. It is going after cancer. It's going after our PPE. It's going after our, our, our health, both mental, physical, and so on, to try and extend the life of firefighters. Uh, they are, in, in turn, trying to extend uh, our ability to cover and protect the citizens. Where we end up coming up with is that, as Jerome mentioned, the numbers that OSHA put together are not realistic for our area. A $1.7 million budget, the only departments in anywhere that operate anywhere, even within Pennington, get close to Pennington County, are would be Ellsworth Air Force Base and Rapid City Fire that operate in the million dollar budget area. The rest of us are probably somewhere around $200,000 or less to try and run what we're trying to do. And so that's one of the primary issues. The second issue we're gonna get into is the time and position on this. Anywhere from two months to two years to implement this, depending upon what the what the what the part of the standard we're speaking of, and we'll get into some of those two-year points, which are mostly based on firefighter physicals and and long-term situations such as vehicle replacement policies, um, it, the um, creating. I'm losing the word right now that I had in, my, in front of me, but we have to build our emergency response plans for a better, lack of a better way to put it, and then we have the time to do those. The two-month things are the things that they think we can go, that they feel that we can go in and just make changes to the policies, procedures we have now. So, um, Commissioner Drews, you asked the question, are we going to have to have to do this? Right now, that is a question that all 50 states, including the 29 states that are OSHA states, are asking the question. Are our firefighters going to have to do it? In particular, our volunteer firefighters in South Dakota, where we become a become an issue because the 6215 actually states that we we can be employees of the county. In that answer, we would be no. But when we look at what the definition of the employer is, that's where OSHA can make the waters muddy on us and still implement it. The backside of it is there's a lot of trickle trickle down parts of this that will affect us, such as the idea that once these, if 20, uh, 156 is approved and actually pushed into a, a formal regulation, the standards from NFPA will start to increase prices on things that we deal with. Uh, the doctors are going to have a little bit more, more concern about giving us a compliant physical as opposed to a physical that actually fits the standard, especially if we get into a, a situation, God forbid, where we actually have a firefighter injury or fatality we have to deal with, then we'll be covered back with this. So is this something that we are going to look at as coming down when, if it gets approved on July 22nd, or is it going to affect us directly? Not immediately. I don't believe it's going to affect us immediately. I believe that what we need to do is get ahead of it and make sure that people under, at OSHA understand where we want to go with this. So uh, Jerome mentioned that there are certain NFPA standards. 
Right now, NFPA is one of the legislative bodies for the fire service. They set what we call standards. And one of the issues we have with this, they are consensus standards. And consensus standards, they actually get to pick the people that, that are sit on the board and allow this standard to pass. If these standards become law, in, as in a regulation, now everybody has to abide by these standards. Uh, and no longer do we have the ability to say no to them. So such situation is if the standard NFPA standard for fire apparatus comes down, not even being suggested, but just an example, that we have to go to electric apparatus by 2035, we would have no recourse to fight that because that would be the law and we would have no, they would have to be uh, present for the, for the states that do function that way. Uh, the manufacturers, in order to stay on this board, would have to abide by that. And they would have to produce all electric apparatus. So uh, one of the issues we have with this consensus is the fact that people that have a financial investment in what happens here are actually going to be decision makers in, in the law. And so that becomes a, a concern. But this incorporated by reference is one of our primary concerns. But let's get down to the real tax that we're talking about. Three primary concerns that we look at. Number one's a monetary concern. And I could go, we could go really deep in this. I want to start with a simple one. Right now, if we have a local uh, physician perform what we call a, a NFPA 1582 compliant, NFPA 1582 is the physical fit, is a physical safety, uh, physical fitness standard. It costs us about 250 to $400, depending upon the, the person we go to. If we turn that with 156 and we have to go to full, fully compliant physicals, now we're looking at anywhere from 800 to 1,000. Uh, certain states are looking at $1,500 per physical. Uh, with us, we can even go from 400 to 800. That's $400 per person. And a fire department in South Dakota has to have at least 12 members, which means we're now almost $5,000 out of pocket just on physicals that would be mandated, where right now we can, we can accept them as we need to and move forward instead of having them mandated. So, you know, we go from departments that, that may have the, maybe offering the $400 one, now they gotta find that extra, extra $5,000 to work. And that's just on these. Uh, a second issue with this, and this is one of the problems that we have, that we're asking with OSHA to meet with the fire service on, is they define a contact of byproducts of combustion. That terminology is inside the inside the thing, and it's in the, the handouts we sent. After 15 contacts with byproducts of combustion, a firefighter would be required to go into monitor uh, monitoring phase or checkups. We have no idea what that cost would be. We have no idea what that means. Uh, it's just one of the things they're trying. Again, they're trying to save people and they're trying to protect us from that long-term cancer and so on. But they're getting into an area we're not. We don't have the answers to to work with. Um, when we look at this 15 exposures, uh, when, they look, when they wrote it out, they believe they set it out as being any contact with byproduct of combustion, so any fire that we go to. Well, one of the consider concerns we have with this, you, you folks know we have a nice big forest to the west of us, Black Hills, Black Hills National Forest. We do have to fight fire in there sometimes, and those are not one day things. We don't go out and, and fight fire and come home that night and, and put it away like we do a, a traditional structure fire. If we spend three days on there, OSHA is very unclear on whether that is one exposure or three exposures. That concern comes from our wild comes from our wildland folks. If they go out for a two week assignment and it's a 14 days on the fire, if that actually counts for 14 exposures, that means every time we send a wildland crew out, they have to go back and get a checkup. And you can see where that would be not only problematic, but, but monetary concern for those folks. Our time concerns. One of the things we have in South Dakota has been, has been great. We are the we are the second most second the the the, st the number two state in the country for the number of volunteer firefighter or volunteer fire departments percentage wise. The only one ahead of us is Pennsylvania. Um, and when we look at this, and we're and we look at the number of people we have, that means if we're volunteers, that means we have another job somewhere else. We have someplace else that we have to give our time to. You, fo you, you, you folks on the board and, and people in the audience, you all have some place you have to be some other time. You know how little time you have. Well, 
were trying to give our, as the volunteers were trying to give their time back, now they're being told they're going to have to have ongoing training that meets their initial certification. <coughs> the initial fire certification was 140, 140 to 160 hours, just under structure fire. Another 40 for their wildland fire, if they have wildland fire. <coughs> 20, anywhere from 40 to 100 for the EMT. Uh, there is no standard in, inside of 156 that says how many hours they need to do. So the closest one we can use is the ISO number, Insurance Services Organization. Uh, they, suggest, they suggest 240 hours per year per firefighter. So what we're looking at is we have to find another six weeks of free time for our firefighters. And this is why we say the time concerns are, are a big concern if we don't, don't address this one. Um, Finally, there's actually certain parts in there that there's an inability to comply. We just cannot do it physically. Uh, this one I'm gonna, gonna reach back to the fire marshal's office on. South Dakota, we use a South Dakota fire marshal's office, certifies state firefighters, they certify officers and driver, drivers of apparatus. Their equivalency is what we call fire officer one. That works for first level officers, your lieutenants, your captains, the guys that sit on the fire truck. But as we move up in the administration, the people that become the assistant chiefs, the, the chiefs, they actually have to go to fire officer two, fire officer three, and even in, in possibility, or in, in a possibility, reach fire officer four. Why this is not, except why this is, in a, in, we have an inability to do this, South Dakota Fire Marshal's Office only recognizes firefighter one. We have one entity in the state, and that's what Lake Area Votech, that has a, an ability to use a fire officer two through an outside certifying agency called Pro Board. Nebraska, Wyoming, they have fire officer two. For our fire chiefs, of which Jerome mentioned, there's five of us in the audience, we would have to go to Colorado to get to fire officer three and work with them. That's the closest available spot. So right now, with the way this sits, we just do not have the ability to, to comply with this part of the standard. And again, this being an NFPA statement, NFPA 1021 is one of those standards in the 22 that will become law or become regulations. So these are where we come with this. So down to the brass tacks of what my presentation is. What we're asking for, we're in a point where we're still trying to find, every, find stuff out. Uh, us, we have, several of us have been talking through folks with the National Volunteer Fire Commit, uh, Council who supports a lot of our fire chiefs and a lot of our training. Uh, we've been working with other industry experts and we're coming down to the point that there's just too many questions yet. So what we're looking for is we're looking for the ability to send a letter from the, from Pennington County through Jerome Harvey's office to the fire administration office of support of the, the local government saying that you see the issues that are coming up and that you think OSHA needs to step, take a, take a pause and work with people in the fire service to better define what we're getting into before we get in, before we take into a path that we can't recover from. Uh, I did, we have included in your path, we've included a, a sam, uh, the request letter and the request letter goes over several of the same things we've already mentioned uh, in this with the final point being that we understand what OSHA is doing, and we think that we think it's a great place to go to. We think it's a great goal. We just don't want to start with the goal. We want to work toward it to where we can actually afford it. Uh, going back to the budget issue, Jerome mentioned the the, the average they're using is one point seven million, and we're looking at two hundred thousand. Another issue that's actually in the in one of the in the uh, the sheet that that I that I offered you that has the highlights in it. Uh, and I want to look up the name so I get you get it right to you. It is the one that uh, called the outline of the of this, and it has several of the colored marks, the the highlighted codes. Near the back of it, it actually tells you that OSHA thinks that this impact is only going to cost about five percent of the budget of the fire departments. It is highlighted in the back pages of that outline for you so you can see where it's at. Uh, and they expect that 5% to be able to be recovered from whoever the governing agency is for our volunteer fire departments. Well, we don't all work on tax districts. A few of, few of the departments are still on their own. 
I'm not sure how you ask people for a 5% increase in, in donations to cover this on an annual basis, but that's there. So these are some of the concerns that we, we see in this. Um, I, I, I have seen that you guys have asked some questions, so I know you guys have, have reviewed this. And so that's where we'd like to end, or I'd like to end my presentation is just asking for your support and allowing Jerome to sign the letter and and address OSHA with our concerns from the state or from the county. Thank you, Chief Jean. Commissioners? Mr. Chair. Mr. Les. I, my question is, and I, as I look through the packet and uh, I noticed the attachments you did and you highlight them, I think it's great that you highlighted that out and that's all going forward as an exhibit to show them what you, you know, which are being done all the way up to items that cannot be done. Are you giving an explanation? I didn't see it in here and maybe I just missed it because I did peruse it a little bit. Are you giving an explanation why some of the red ones can't be done, either financial constraints because like you were just talking about here at the very end, you know, some of these departments, they only get $200,000. It's based on whether or not they're a fire district or not. Some of them are just on, on donations, you know, kind of putting that information in there as well. I, I did not put that into your packet. There is, there are explanations in the letter as to why we, why we did that and put those in there. In okay. particular, the donations and, the, and that are in that. So. Fair enough, Mr. Mr. Drews. So, Chief Jaden, I, I, I appreciate your explanation uh, of, of this and, uh, and the intent of it. Uh, I, do have, I do have concerns. Uh, and I do think that as uh, Jerome mentioned earlier, I think it needs, even this needs to have legal counsel review uh, before we do that. I think it needs our risk manager to review uh, how, it, how it could possibly impact us in the future and so forth. Uh, anytime that uh, we talk about OSHA, uh, since we aren't required at this point in time to be part of the OSHA regulations, it brings a concern to me as to implications in the future if we try to maybe pick and choose what we want to be a part of as far as OSHA is concerned. And so I'm going to, uh, my ask would be to uh, defer this until the, our July 16th meeting, giving uh, legal counsel an opportunity to look at it, giving uh, Walter uh, as the risk manager opportunity to work with legal and, and with with all of you as far as trying to make sure that what we're asking uh, is uh, appropriate and that it's something that if the answers come back as we would desire, uh, that is something that we can do as a county. I, I, and I agree, I agree with that completely. I think this need, this, sh I, I do think that this should not be decided today. I think you need input from more fire, fire chiefs and fire officers than myself. Um, I just agree, we agreed that we should bring it up to you, to you so we could get it done in time for the 20 sec for the, the 22nd deadline. Um, you know, one of the biggest concerns is, you know, with, with South Dakota, we do not have to, the state, state and county entities do not have to abide. And that's why it comes back to really understanding what OSHA is going to define it and, and where we need proper, a lot more better legal minds than, yeah. than we have. Um, to decide what an employee, who the employer actually is, because if we fall back to private employ employment because we are individual fire departments, then we do fall into this when they pass it. Mr. Chair, do you have a follow up, Gary? Uh, I, no, my follow up will be a motion. Okay, Mr. I just had a clarifying question. So as long as we, whatever happens on July 16th, that's enough time to get it there because that's just their deadline for taking um, basically comments about it. They're not making a decision on the 22nd. That is correct. It's open for comment until the 22nd. Okay, that's what I just want to make sure. Thank okay. you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Oscar. So with this, uh, these standards that were being discussed, would they have a greater impact? I assume they affect uh, paid stations as well as volunteers, but I assume the biggest impact is going to be on volunteers because of the budget restraints. Not just because of the budget constraints, but because the volunteers are going to be the, the volunteers are the question as to where their employment lies. Um, this, the career departments, they are usually a city entity. They are, are an entity of, a, of the state or the county. And so they have a very clear uh, exemption from these, from these and they have their own pathway to follow. 
uh, as to whether they use a code or anything that their their government entity is, has uh, adopted. For the volunteers is where this concern purely lies because the question always comes back. Yes, the you get you folks pay our, our workers comp, but is that enough to define the employer? Do you think this, uh, if this went in the effect, it'd be harder to recruit volunteers uh, in the Absolutely. different departments in Mr. Chairman, County? absolutely. Um, the, <clears throat> one of the biggest issues is the one-size-fits-all approach. They're looking at the entire fire service as the same. 96.6% of South Dakota fire service all volunteer. <clears throat> one-size-fits-all, and that, that just doesn't, we don't have the wherewithal to pull that off. And then you're asking, like he's talking about, we need six more weeks for you to train this. We need 173 hours for a person to do planning. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. 3,000 pages, additional pages of standards to go through. Where do you get the time for that? Yeah, I totally understand. You know, I was a volunteer firefighter back in 19, 10 years. And it, Back then, it was, you know, we still had some training to do and whatnot, but I, you know, in the last six years being on the commission, I just see we're just putting more and more uh, uh, responsibility and on, on volunteers that have families and stuff, and they could sit there and say, you know what, this is just too much for me. I'm going to not get a volunteer. So. Agreed. And final comment on this for that is, you know, and, and for years, Jerome and I started back shortly after after your time um, is yes the volunteers have, have given from their heart and so on it's why we we're not standing against this policy and, and I agree with, agree with Commissioner Drew is we do need to make make sure our ducks are in a row before we approach any of this but I believe that what OSHA is really trying to do is it's going to make us harder to get volunteers but it's going to make our it's going to make our status and protecting them better if we can adopt and get to that point together and not just have this dead set line that we have to accomplish. Well, just know that the commission fully supports volunteer fire, de fire departments in Pennington County and that uh, we just want to make sure that we get our ducks in a row. So thank you uh, for the presentation. It was a good presentation today. Yep. And I'm, I'm glad that you clarified that you're agreeing that it needs to go to legal and some more. This presentation brings it not only to the public eye, but to our eye, and, we, and gives us an idea of your concerns, and that you're very valid. So, Mr. Drews. Chair, sure, I would uh, I'd make a motion that we uh, defer item 16 uh, for the purpose of having uh, legal counsel and uh, our risk manager uh, work with the fire service in determining uh, or move forward second on this issue moved by Drew second by Lassiter any further discussion hearing none all in favor indicate by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries thank, thank you. you commissioners thank you guys next that brings us up to item 17 items from the auditor Cindy Moore Good morning, Commissioner Cindy Muller, Pennington County Auditor. On May 7th, we had you approve a transfer of retail on off sale malt beverage and South Dakota Farm wine license in anticipation of the firehouse um, wine cellar selling to Billy Bob's Smoke Shack. That sale did not go through, so we would like you to rescind that motion. Mr. Lasser. Move to rescind the motion made on May 7, 2024, to transfer the retail on off sale malt beverage and South Dakota farm wine license from Firehouse Wine Cellars to Billy Bob's Smoke Shack. Second. Moved by Laster, seconded by Drews. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item B. Yeah, the second part of that is to now renew the license, the retail on off sale malt beverage and South Dakota farm wine license for Firehouse Wine Cellar. I'd make that motion. Second. Moved, moved by Drew, seconded by Lassiter. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Next, this brings us up to item 18, items from the sheriff, and I'll recognize Brian Mueller, Sheriff Mueller. 
Good morning, Commission. Brian Mueller, Pennington County Sheriff. I'm here in front of you today to request a motion to authorize our office to create a care campus director position, reestablish that position. And as you know, through the first 18 months in office, and I wrote this in the, in the letter to you, but uh, I've gone through each of the four divisions and reevaluated the span of control to make sure we have the right people in the right place to manage the valuable resources that we have. And I appreciate the support that you've all given me as we've gone through and made changes in the law enforcement division, in the jail and the juvenile services center. Uh, the last division that, that I'm going through at this time is the care campus. And the motion that I'm requesting today is to reestablish the, the director that oversees the care campus. And as you know, about 10 years ago, Brenda Wood, the former director, retired. And at the time, Sheriff Tome did not replace the, that position. And we have uh, provided oversight by through uh, temporarily using law enforcement captains. Um, right now, I'm using a chief deputy to provide oversight. He also has oversight over the Juvenile Services Center. But we have a lot of uh, major things going on over at the CARE campus right now that I think need some real immediate attention. Our two directors that we have, we have a clinical director, Deanna Nolan, who oversees our administrative office staff and all of the counselors. And uh, we have a housing director, David Oster, who oversees about 44 staff and they do a variety of different jobs. Most of them are detox technicians that supervise the housing units, but he also oversees all the medical staff, all of the custodians, all of the uh, um, building staff that, that work over there directly report to David. And uh, we have some real, real time sensitive things that are coming up right now that I'm trying to work on. And I listed those six things out in the letter to you. Um, and I'll just go through them quick so the public has an opportunity to hear them. But, but this really is a necessary change to get the business model in order. And one of the main things that I'm trying to work on is, as you know, as we've had to continually reduce the U.S. Marshals to keep room for our local jail population, it's decreased revenue to Pennington County, which is could really put us in a pickle. You know, this year, this year we've, we've uh, dropped those U.S. Marshal numbers down closer to 100 and uh, trying to find new ways to create revenue to offset some of that. Uh, we have worked with the state to increase our fees for the first time in, in a number of years over there. So our revenues are on the rise, but so is the workload administratively. And I have some real some things that are coming up that I need people to be able to provide, to give their full-time attention to. And right now, David and Deanna really have their hands full with managing is the 70 staff that we currently have over there. So one of the things is to, to address the jail revenue um, that I just talked about with the marshals decreasing. Um, the second thing on that list, the six that I provided is uh, they need an administrator to oversee the Ignite work program. We have, I appreciate the support in that. As you know, the city and county funded a two year pro pilot project for that. I'm working out the final details with the state's attorney's office this year. We'll have that program up and running within the jail in July, and we're gonna transfer that, that uh, 17 bed program over to the care campus in August. This new director will oversee um, all the fine details in implementing that, working together with the courts, working together with our staff, our other community providers to help make sure that's a, that transition works smoothly. The third thing on the list is I need an administrator to uh, affect the necessary changes related to our cultural programming that we're doing at the CARE Campus. As you saw, Barry Tice and I two months ago put out a request for some cultural partners to come alongside of us, specifically to deal with some of our chronic um, Native American um, utilizers of services over there. We have, we've had a couple of meetings, we're gaining a little bit of support, but I need a manager at the care campus to step in in my place to help manage the day-to-day -day workings of that as we, as we move some of those ideas forward. Uh, the care campus revenues are also on the rise and we have an opportunity to coordinate more resources to increase that revenue to offset the revenue that we're losing at the jail and right now we're running too many open treatment beds in the care campus. And that requires a lot of coordination at the state level, but also through the state's attorney's office, the public defender's office and the courts. And the, the directors that I have do not have the time to go spend the, deep, the, the amount of time that we need to do to work to keep, that, to keep those beds full. I think we have a real opportunity uh, to increase those beds. I think today we're running 15 open treatment beds. And in a facility where I have 400 people 
locally sitting in the jail, and many of those, um, you know, have landed there as a result of substance abuse. I think we have a real opportunity to run those beds full, which again will continue to increase revenue for Pennington County, but also for those individuals, maybe give them a fighting chance when they get through treatment to not reoffend and come back into our system again. And then the last thing is, uh, you know, we continue to face the challenge of hiring and retaining employees and creating this director to run the business model and oversee the budget end of things over there at the care campus and coordinate our resources will allow David and Deanna to spend a little bit more time with our line level supervisors and line level staff to work on that very important um, retention and uh, recruitment aspect that's very necessary to keep things running smoothly in Pennington County. Um, so I'm here today to ask for the motion to create this, recreate this new position. I'm not asking for an FTE. I'm going to utilize a current open detox technician FTE. I'm not asking for any additional funding this year. And I will, I, I think I'm up for executive session to talk through uh, any specifics and answer any questions about who I would put into that position. But I'd stand for any questions related to this, adding this position at this time. Mr. Chair, I have a couple. Mr. Laster. Uh, Brian, you just mentioned about that you're going to use a current FTE, an open detox tech position. Correct. Is that your last open detox position? Well, I mean, we have we have three or four that we're working on filling right now. I just won't fill one of them. You just won't fill one of them. Correct. Mr. Chair, follow up with that. Um, do you anticipate in your proposed budget that you'll have to add a new FTE to compensate for the transition of that? Uh, detox tech over to the this position. I'm not planning on doing that at this time. No. Any further questions, Mr. Chair? I'll go ahead and make the motion to move to approve the new position of the care campus director DBM D61 for three thousand two hundred sixty-two dollars <coughs> and forty cents biweekly, and to update the position listing on file. Second. Moved by Rosknek, seconded by Drews. My comment would be, Brian, is I think this is a good move. Um, I, I do remember Doug Austin being the director at one time and Brenda Woods, and, and I think you're absolutely right. You need, you need someone who has the full attention uh, of what's happening there to, because it's that it's someone who has the big picture, because you have the counselors you got to get and so forth. So I agree with that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sheriff. Item 19 from Buildings and Grounds. I would recognize Director Davis Purcell. Hello, good morning, Commission. Uh, Davis Purcell, Buildings and Grounds Director. Um, before you, I just have a, a simple request here um, to surplus our 2006 uh, plumber's van. Uh, which in turn will be traded in and then allow us to purchase a 2024 uh, van. Um, we did um, account for this in our uh, 2024 budget. So stand for any questions. Any questions for Davis? I'd look for sure. Mr. Drews. I'd move to declare one 2006 Ford Ecoline, Econoline E150 van asset number 22327, a surplus for the purpose of trade-in. Second. Moved by Drew, seconded by Rosconnect. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item B. Uh, just Item B is just the additional <coughs> motion there to authorize the purchase of the 2024 van. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. I have moved to authorize uh, buildings and grounds to purchase one 2024 Ram Pro Master van from Liberty Superstores, Rapid City, in the amount of $46,499. Second. Moved by Drew, second by Rosconnect. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor and keep us saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Items from Fire Administration, Jerome Harvey. Good morning again, Commissioners. Jerome Harvey, Penny County Fire Administrator. Uh, today we're asking you to continue our uh, grant program to our volunteer fire departments. In the past, this is referred to as our five-year plan. 
It's always been in our budget for over 30 years. Uh, we did do a process this past year of streamlining the process, uh, making it more efficient, uh, less burdensome on the paperwork. Uh, it does give our departments a little more leeway with the funding to be not focused just on PPE. Uh, we did change, um, go through legal. They advised us to change the verbiage to grants. And then auditor picked up on that saying, well, we need to come before you and ask you permission, not only in our budget process last year, but also ask you today to approve this um, money to these six fire departments in the letter. The money again is used for personal protective equipment and they can use it for a pretty defined list of items to operate the fire departments on. I have uh, at least two of our members here uh, that are receiving the uh, funds this year. If you have any questions of those particular fire chiefs, they're standing by here. Thanks, Jerome. Is there any questions for Jerome? Yes, Chair. Mr. Drews. So uh, this is an alternating, I mean a... Uh, yes, it does. We had a, the calendar, uh, calendar goes back originally. We actually have it back to 94 and 95. The calendar rotates. It was on a five-year... Five-year rotation was called the five-year plan. It's been there for 30-some years now. And there was a lot of, um, it was focused just on one area. The departments were struggling with needs in some other areas. And so we went from working with our legal, we went from a five-year plan to three years. And then it's on a rotational calendar basis. And we've actually saved some money by doing this. And then cutting out a lot of, I got drawers full of receipts. That, what you know just it's just crazy little, little things are in there so going to more of the grant approach uh, we're able to help them a little faster uh, a little broader range of aspects we can help them with follow up mr so so next year we'll see several different departments correct right yeah okay. yeah it's on the then it's determined by the board we have the calendar it's in the best operating practice for the three-year plan that calendar everybody gets to see it so they know that it's there and when their turn is coming up okay mr Thank chair you. mr Oskin. we have to approve the three-year grant agreements with the following bone following volunteer fire departments battle creek box elder doty scenic silver city and wasta and further moved to authorize audit Auditor's office to issue payment to each department in the amount of $2,500. Second. Moved by Roskinex, seconded by Laster. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Jerome. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you. Next, this brings us up to item number 21 items from the Highway Department, and I'll recognize Superintendent Joe Miller. Good morning, Commission. Joe Miller, Pennington County Highway Department. Wow. Is that just me or is that an echo? <laughs> a little loud, but that's okay. I'll stand back here, I guess. Um, up first here is a, a presentation from KLJ on our master transportation plan that has been recently uh, uh, recently done. Um, with that, I will ask Steve with KLJ. You've seen him last time, and we'll get this up and going. We've seen you a lot, Steve. So welcome, yes. Welcome, yes. Steve. Been just, busy. <laughs> just recognize yourself for the record. Hi, my name is Steve Grable with KLJ. Uh, I was the project manager for developing a new master transportation plan for Pennington County. Um, this is the, the first uh, master plan that the, the county has undertaken in over 10 years. And there's been a lot that's changed over the, that last 10 years. Um, but it's, it's important to recognize that with a master transportation plan, this is more of a 30,000 foot view of your overall transportation system. It looks at all modes of travel, it looks at existing conditions, and then we do a projection at least 20 years into the future. One of the unique things that we also did with this plan is uh, before we even started, uh, your staff identified uh, 15 locations where, I'll just call them locations of concern, um, where there were p potential safety issues, potential traffic issues, a lot of growth. So um, in these locations, we actually did get down into the weeds a little bit. I personally uh, uh, visited all of these sites. I took photographs. Uh, we looked at traffic and crash data at all these locations. And we provided a uh, uh, recommendations for all of them. We took a look at uh, whether there were capacity issues. 
Uh, these these uh, letters represent a uh, level of service with A being great and F being poor. So uh, we were able to identify, you know, if there's capacity issues, um, you know, what type of capacity issues, and then to come up with recommendations for all of the sites. Uh, the, uh, what you're seeing here is just an example of some of the recommendations. So one of the locations we looked at was Sheridan Lake Road in Dunsmore. I used to live up that area and uh, it gets very busy uh, at some, especially that AM peak sometimes. So we took a look at the signal timings, uh, gave recommendations for future uh, changes in signalization. Again, we're seeing a lot of growth there as well. Um, another location that we looked at was Concourse Road and Twilight Drive. And again, the, your PM peaks, it gets very busy um, in that area. And, and we provided a variety of recommendations to help improve that in the future. Uh, it's important to recognize, though, that this plan serves mainly as a tool, both for engineering and planning staff. So it doesn't tie the county down to any of the recommendations, but it essentially uh, gives them a, a course forward. And uh, so all these 15 locations, uh, they would certainly need additional uh, uh, design analysis and so on. We looked at uh, uh, your recent crash history countywide. I think the good news is that it it's staying relatively stable. Um, and that is good news because we're seeing increases in traffic. We're seeing a lot of growth. And so this indicates that the county is making headway on various safety improvements. One of the key things that we were asked is, well, where are where is the growth occurring and how is it affecting our, our road system? So uh, we did, uh, take a very detailed look as to where the growth is occurring. And then we highlighted the corridors that are being impacted by growth. Um, let's see, I'll go back to that for a sec. So wh what this growth is indicating is that for the most part, your county road system is able to handle the traffic. Um, where you're gonna see the need for improvements is primarily in turn lanes, uh, the county may start to see some traffic signals on your system here and there. Um, there may be other improvements, but for the most part, a two-lane roadway on your, on your entire system is going to be fine for the most part. Um, where you're also going to see changes is in the uh, wear and tear on your roads. And uh, I'll get to that a little bit more shortly, but um, just taking a look at how this growth is increasing, you're going to see uh, uh, the potential for the need for more overlays, uh, some reconstructions, and uh, perhaps uh, wider shoulders here and there. Fortunately, the county, as you know, um, did a, a pavement condition analysis not too long ago. So we did incorporate the findings of that in general, your, your paved roads are in very good condition. Uh, one thing we worked with your staff to do, though, was to set a future threshold of uh, traffic level for where you should start considering to pave your gravel roads. So when you get calls from constituents saying, hey, when are you going to pave my road? Uh, this threshold is going to be a guideline. But the other thing we did is we did traffic projections so that some of the future projects for paving in this plan, what, what put them in, in as a future paving project is this threshold, that as that traffic reaches that uh, threshold for paving, then the county should consider uh, converting it from gravel to pavement. So this is a map that just highlights the results of your, your pavement conditions. Again, all green is a real good <laughs> indicator that your paved roads are in good condition. Uh, some of the recommendations in the plan I'll highlight briefly. Um, we did take a look at you know, areas where you need new 
consider future roads. You know, Rapid Valley is growing. Uh, you know, in the Radar Hill Road, you're seeing more developments off Radar Hill Road. So more roads in there and then in the, in the airport vicinity. Um, jurisdictional transfer is an issue we looked at and one uh, road that stood out is uh, the I-90 service road that is currently being maintained by the county could potentially be a good candidate to transfer over to Box Elder. Um, functional classification, uh, there were issues with the county's classification where it doesn't match up with either the DOT or uh, Rapid City. So we highlighted where those <coughs> are occurring and I believe the county is working with the EMPO to, uh, to try and uh, mesh, make sure uh, those classifications systems mesh. We also looked at your ordinances and standards and uh, you know, highlighted if there were any changes that were recommended. Again, this is a, a, a table indicating how Ordinance 14 uh, requirements lay out. And then we provided some additional uh, typical section information that the road department can use when, when you have a development come in and they're asking, well, what, what do my internal roads look, need to look like? We gave them some very good visual information as to, depending on the classification of the road, uh, what standards they need to meet. And we did that both for rural roads and for urban with curb and gutter. Access management is an important item. Again, we highlighted, uh, you know, essentially that the county should be trying to keep your roads in line with, with state standards for how many accesses per mile are allowed. Some of the other things we addressed is intersection control warrants. There's good guidance information in the plan for when you should be putting in turn lanes. And then we also recommended that the county consider an ordinance that would uh, require traffic impact studies for certain uh, uh, development sizes. And then we provide information in this plan as to what that ordinance might include. Sure. Mr. Drews. Steve, can you expand on that item just a little bit? Yes. So one of the, the concerns with development is that you can have a development in the county that will impact your roads. But if the ordinance doesn't uh, require them to take a look at how that development is going to impact the adjacent roads, then a lot of times the, the costs for adding a turn lane, adding a signal, doing things that are being um, required as a result of that development are borne by the county. So what a traffic impact study will allow you to do is as part of the development approval process, they have to do their own traffic impact study, understand whether that, that they're gonna be required to put in turn lanes or signals or some other improvements as part of their development. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Ruskin. Are there any particular areas in Pennington County that uh, you could see that being an issue based on the uh, current development? I, I think it could be anywhere in the county. I, um, it, it's really tied to the size of the development. The small developments, you know, we're not too concerned about because normally, you know, 10, 12, you know, 20 vehicles a day isn't going to really affect things. It's really for the developments that are of adequate size. And then that could affect a road anywhere in the county if you get a large development. Well, I was just thinking of Anderson Road and Highway 44, for an example. Just so that I try to get an understanding. Yeah, uh, Joe Miller, Pennington County Highway Department. Uh, I, with the Apple Valley out on Anderson Road and Longview Road, um, I don't know, Brittany would be the one to, to speak to that, but I think because it was planted under the city, they fell under the city's uh, requirements for that, in which they required a traffic impact study, which we received. Um, and I know there was a lot of debate on that early on, on the scope of that, right, on how far out it actually looked. Um, but I don't know that, I, I can't answer the question that if, 
Pennington County's development ordinances or subdivision ordinances require a traffic impact study. So if we were to get outside that three mile jurisdiction, um, you know, one that comes to mind right now is the uh, um, the one down on Highway 79, 114 lots down there. You know, that development, if it ever comes to fruition, would that require a traffic impact study? I don't know. Um, I did send Brittany a message to see if she could come down and, and speak to that. But, uh, yeah, I, I can't answer that would question. Would that be something you think we should pursue then, that ordinance? I think it would be beneficial to the county um, because otherwise the burden, as Steve right. said, falls on the county. And, I mean, you're talking 10, 20,000, 30,000 bucks probably um, by the time well, you're I, done I, with it. I'd support that, yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. And, and 140 lots would definitely fall within the the requirements of a traffic impact study as, as we would recommend. I just wondered, uh, when you think of development, well, this isn't really development, but when we move to concourse, uh, I just wondered if there's any consideration to the change in the traffic pattern on Elkvale and uh, uh, Homestead. Could very well be, and that's one of the benefits also of doing a traffic impact study is you get to uh, understand, you know, how it will influence the traffic before uh, day one of opening hits and all of a sudden you need a police officer out there helping to, you know, <laughs> maintain the chaos. Thank you. Another issue that came up that uh, we tried to address is UTV, ATV use in the county, which we're seeing a significant uh, increase over the last, you know, five, ten years in especially the UTV traffic. Uh, um, I mean, I drive out around 385 over by the Sugar Shack, and you, you can hardly, uh, uh, I think the UTVs outnumber the cars certain days of the week, but um, so what we tried to do is identify which roads were most impacted by uh, UTV, ATV use and uh, which ones were, were near trailheads. Uh, so there's some good mapping information in this plan to, to send that message to the county of which roads you know, may have concern. And then we provide some ideas for how to better manage the ATV, UTV traffic, whether it be signage, uh, dealing with uh, uh, site distance concerns at the trailheads. So th there's some ideas in there uh, that would have to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, uh, just one comment. Uh, this was the this issue came up in a couple of the public input meetings. So I think it is something that the public is, is definitely aware of and you will probably be hearing more of as uh, this, this issue continues. We also uh, just had the recommendation that there are pedestrian bicycle facility recommendation that the Metropolitan Planning Organization has. So making sure as the county system is up Dated that we uh, t tie in with their system. Uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the DOT, and Federal Highway were also part of this study and helped fund it. So we provided recommendations. Uh, one of the recommendations, and this was in your last plan, is essentially where you can, if you can get four foot shoulders at least on your county roads, it helps facilitate that bicycle traffic. And there were some roads that were uh, highlighted as, as candidates. We did stop short of making recommendations for that in specific places because we know there's a lot of issues that uh, need to be addressed, whether it be cost, right of way, impacts the property, and so on. Um, air transportation, we essentially just looked at the uh, Rapid City uh, Airport plan and made sure we were consistent with that. Uh, same with transit. Uh, there are uh, known uh, transit desires out there, but at this point, the county has not been uh, uh, too involved on the transit side and the funding to um, expand transit out into the county is, uh, is not there. So where did we end up? Um, we ended up with uh, 
roughly 80 projects in the plan, uh, 46 short range and 34 long range. Again, this does not supersede your five-year plan. So your five-year plan is really the instrument that the county uses for that five years. Uh, but we did try and uh, be consistent with that, as well as to provide some ideas of, you know, what are your next projects that you, you might want to consider as you annually update your five-year plan. We did provide some planning level cost estimates in the plan so that the county has an idea of what are the costs of some of these projects. So as your priorities change, something that's currently in the short, the long range and you want to move it into the sh short range, you'll have at least some idea of what types of costs you're looking at. And then we mapped all of these projects again so that it's a, a functional tool if, if you're trying to link the projects in the table with the pro projects on the map. And we did the same for bridges and culverts. So that's my presentation. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions. We're uh, looking for you to accept the plan today if that is your will. Mr. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Steve. Mr. Raskinek. I'm looking at the uh, key representatives uh, from the county, state, and federal agencies and relative to the UTV traffic. Uh, I, I don't see the Forest Service on there. And they're currently going through their uh, 15, 20 uh, re uh, revision on their master plan. So I just, they're the ones that are probably going to have the most teeth relative to that uh, ATV traffic. We did have dialogue with the Forest Service. They weren't on our uh, task force, but uh, all of the mapping was uh, obtained from the Forest Service. And then uh, we had uh, dialogues with them both as to trying to be consistent with their standards, as well as to uh, uh, make sure that we were getting it right as far as you know our impact locations. But you know, some of those key roads, and I travel the Mystic Road quite a bit, and and I think that the majority of the damage and wear and tear are these ATVs, UTVs. I mean, they're not just, when they come off of a, a side road, you know, they're, you can see the damage that they're doing and something definitely needs to be done relative to the increased traffic from those particular type of vehicles. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Ron. Any other questions for Steve? Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. So when we talk about going from gravel to pavement. I mean, obviously there's a lot of standards that have to be met there, but uh, vehicle traffic, certainly the number of vehicle traffic is certainly considered. Do we also measure, you know, the type of vehicles that are on those roads? Yes, the, the truck traffic is, uh, is a huge impact on the the uh, impacts on the gravel roads. It's often the, the biggest impact. Normally, unless there's a, a localized uh, truck generator, we generally have an assumption that there's at least eight to 12 percent trucks. So uh, when the county does their counts and if there's a elevated number of trucks that can certainly be be used in the in the guidance so is there a conversion factor on on trucks as to uh how that actually impacts i mean i know i've seen numbers where it says that you know a, one garbage truck equals x amount of car traffic uh, but it's actually more than that because of the weight that's on those trucks and so forth that really create uh, damage, especially to shoulders and so forth to those roads. And that, that's also where the, uh, the county's pavement analysis um, report and, and doing extra geotechnical, because even like you said, one garbage truck on a road that doesn't have the adequate base can do a tremendous amount of damage. So some of it may not be like you're saying, uh, real tied to the the average daily traffic. If there's other issues out there, um, this is primarily just again a, a tool to start with. The truck traffic, you're right, is is something that falls in with with the uh, the type of road that's out there, and like. And if there's a heavy truck generator, that would certainly have to, to fa 
factor in. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Any final comments? Joe? Gary, much to your point, um, the question you just asked is, um, it's funny you asked that because I just got received an email on the county convention. They're going to do a uh, an hour-long presentation on, on just that, trucks versus cars and weight limits and all that stuff. So um, you'll learn more about that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different methodologies and things out there when you start talking about that, the conversion factors. So, Thanks, Joe. Look for a motion. You need a motion on that? You don't. Yeah, motion to authorize. Motion to accept, oh, the, accept the, uh, the plan as presented. That would be my motion to accept the plan as presented. Moved by Lasseter, second by Drews. All in favor indicate saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The reason I ask that, folks, is because at the MPO meeting, we approved it. <laughs> that was yesterday or day before. So. Okay, item number B, Joe. Uh, item B, uh, authorization to purchase bulk, bulk diesel and gas products um, from the state contract. Uh, we've done this for as long as we can find, I guess. Um, it's a lot easier for us to just buy off the state contract because they go through and, and update all the prices on a, on a daily basis um, and they fluctuate throughout the year. As you can see, uh, the, the contract price right now as of the date of this memo was um, $2.65 contract price. The pump price was $3.35 a gallon. Um, and last year at this time, it was $3.19 on the state contract. So it's beneficial for us and it saves us a lot of time and energy. Um, if we weren't to buy off the state contract every time we wanted to buy fuel, we would have to go out and get three bids. Um, and it's just a, a cumbersome process if we don't do this. So. Thanks, Joe. And I will be abstaining from this because my employer is MGI. Any discussion? Questions? I'd look for a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. Move to authorize the highway department to purchase bulk diesel and gas products from the state contract list addendum one for contracts number 17752, Harms Oil, Brookings, South Dakota, number 17754, MG Oil, Rapid City, and number 17756, Moil Petroleum, Rapid City. Have a motion. Second. Seconded by Lasseter. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries with three ayes and one abstention. Item C. Item C, authorization to purchase uh, guardrail pro products and repair from the state contract. Uh, we reached out to Hilton construction and they have agreed to extend the state pricing for the replacement of guardrail um, this is used you know if uh, Ron your neck of the woods when that guardrail got hit right there on Deerfield Road um, that's something that our county forces can't necessarily do um, so there's several <coughs> guardrails like that throughout the county we contract with Hilt um, previous years we've let contracts for this but after conversations with Hilt they give us the same pricing as the state. So it just behooves us to, to not go through that step process and not have another contract hanging out there. So um, we've elected to go this route and uh, we'll stand for any questions. Any questions for Joe? I go to the board for a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. Move to authorize the highway department to purchase guardrail repair on an as-needed basis from Hill Construction, Rapid City, South Dakota, utilizing the state contract for Project 00N-469, PCN I-7K-8, and OOOP-469, uh, PCN I-7K-9. Second. Moved by Drew, second by Rosconnect. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Commission. Next, we have items from Human Resource, and I'll recognize Risk Manager Walter McDuff. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Walter McDuff, Penty County Risk Manager. What I bring uh, for you today 
is uh, back on April 19th, you guys approved an extension to the concealed carry policy for employees in Pennington County to be effective of 24 June, so I could have a chance to speak with all departments. I had that chance to speak with all departments and offices, and the changes are indicated in the policy that uh, you guys have in your packet. Uh, I, pr I request that you guys approve the policy with still the effective date as of 24 June. I'll stand by for any questions. Thanks, Walter. Is there any questions for Walter? Mr. Chair. Mr. Lester. Hey, Walter, thanks for this. Um, reading it, there's only one question that I really have. I saw in definitions we, you know, we crossed out carry and then put possess a pistol. And the only reason um, I'm asking this question is because I also noticed lower it did say carry. So I just was wanting to understand were we trying to get into a consistency of something or was it just based on the definition and, and whatnot? You know. So for that, Commissioner, uh, good question. For the reason that was crossing out carry and putting possess because we want to emphasize that an employee that is basically allowed to possess a firearm in that definition instead of just carry, that definition broadens them having to understand what it means to possess. Gotcha. Okay. I just wanted to make sure, you know, it was just more because I saw carry in one and crossed out and said possess. And then the other one, it says may carry. So I was kind of like, <laughs> excuse me, as the lawyer stands up here to kind of get a clarification. <laughs> it was, it was actually kind of our last second uh, approach to stating the obvious. If you can't even possess the firearm, clearly you can't carry it concealed on your body. So it was just to get right down to the the nitty gritty of the reality that if you can't even possess a firearm or ammunition under federal or state law, then we're done. Because you can't be an eligible employee because you obviously can't carry. Fair enough. That would be a form of possession. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Any further questions? I go to the board for a motion. Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Mr. Roskinek. Move to approve the policy changes for the concealed carry by non-law enforcement employees. Policy 2.16, effective Monday, June 4th, June 24th, 2024. Second. Moved by Roskinek, seconded by Laster. Any further discussions? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Walter, for your Thank work you, on this. Next, we come up to item B, policy 2.9 cell phones, and I'll recognize Sandy Sortland. Good morning, Commissioner. Sandy Sortland, Human Resources Generalist. This policy was actually updated originally quite a while ago. Um, we've been able to get back to our handbook update project uh, with the addition of our risk manager. Took some things off my plate. So before you, you see uh, the memo and all of the specific items that were called into question um, by different entities and the answers to those. Basically, we're just asking to update it. We reduced uh, the page count from four pages to two and just made it easier to read and understand for our department heads and our employees. And now we have, if you have any questions, please let me know. Is there any questions from the board? Seeing no questions, I would go to the board for a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. Move to approve the revision to policy 2.9 cell phones as recommended. Moved by Laster. Second. Second by Roskinect. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Item C is new position. And I'll recognize HR Director Carol Bancroft. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Carol Bancroft, HR Director for Pennington County. And I want to preface both of these items with number one, most important, no new FTE. Rather, it's taking a look at what are the county needs as far as the evolving um, increase in employees, uh, different labor demands, et cetera, to make sure that our organizational structure is a better fit for what those needs are. So the first one that I wanted to share with you is that we do have a member of our HR staff who is retiring in August. And so that is an opportune time for us to take a look at this organizational structure and say, 
what is this position currently doing? What do we need it to do in the future? So after a very careful and thorough review, that it became apparent that the incumbent individual is currently doing more of recruiting efforts and some administrative duties. And so it's a better fit for a position description of an HR recruiter, social media specialist. And this position, if approved, would be uh, under the supervision of the marketing manager position within our organizational structure. So as I said, it's not an adding of an FTE, it's just a change for a new position to better define what the department needs are. And it would be at the same DBM rating of B23 with a base hourly rate of 2234. So if approved, the motion could read, move to approve new position of HR recruiter, social media specialist at DBM B23 base pay 2234 hourly, and to authorize human resources to update the position listing. Mr. I'll stand Chair. for any questions. Mr. Glaster. Carol, I got a couple of questions. I, <coughs> well, I understand taking you know, a duty title administration assistant to, which might be very generic, and then kind of tailoring that. We're doing that in my organization right now as we speak. We're kind of figuring out and then trying to figure out how to play, get the right people in those positions. I, I understand that. Um, so I'm not necessarily opposed to this particular idea of, of giving a, a more structure to a, a particular position. Have you evaluated this? And this is also going to be my question for the next item. So I'll just kind of give you the preemptive. Uh, have you evaluated this position under the current wage study plan to see what the impact is and what will that impact be? Yes, so it's been evaluated under both the DBM process as well as the proposed 2025. And so it's a lateral as far as what the administrative specialist would have been in the 2025. And so it's going to be at that same rating that the administrative specialist would have been. So Mr. Chair, follow up. So as the, as the um, job descriptions kind of wash out, uh, there won't be any adjustment on it. It'll be the same pay as it crosses over. It won't, be, it won't adjust in that. It won't be a, an up or down change. It will, let me clarify, with the 2025 wage scale, if there's an adjustment on that for that particular pay band that this falls into, there would be an adjustment with that, but just strictly because it's going on to the new pay scale, not because it's being rated higher under the new process. Right. So explain that a little bit. What do you mean by that pay band? It's going to go straight across, but would, how, would it, how would it impact in a positive higher cost maybe? If that particular pay band for all positions in that pay band, if that's going to have a higher base salary than what the current DBM rating is, then there could be an increase with it in this particular position that um, it is one step. So 1.5%. Okay, so we don't see a significant increase in this if depending on who gets in that position role. Correct. Okay. Is there any further questions from the board? Seeing none, I'd go to the board for motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. I would move to approve the new position of HR recruiter, social media specialist at DBMB 23. $22.34 an hour, and to update the position listing on file. Second. Moved by Drew, seconded by Laster. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chair. Clarification, you said Lasseter seconded. I think it was Ross Connect that was seconded. Did I? Correct. <laughs> I heard my name, but I was Ross like, Connect, uh, Ross, <laughs> Drew's... Uh, Drew moved and seconded by Ross Connect. Sorry. No, you're good. I just happened to hear like, well. Item D. So the, the next position in this reorganization would be to create a new position of senior HR manager. And again, this is not adding an FTE. It is simply uh, changing position and responsibilities. So the HR department that... Being uh, the senior HR manager, 
that this individual would oversee as far as the day-to-day -day operations, and that would include that being a resource for all of the county HR, including the sheriff's office, that helping to mentor and grow that team. So I've outlined within this some of the key points, what the restructuring and what the support of this position would, would do for the county that of course are emerging demands, that there's the changing landscape that's going on within Pennington County, which uh, has a growing demand for specialized expertise in the senior HR management skills. So this position would provide the necessary focus to address those emerging needs. Also enhance service delivery, that by creating a dedicated role for day-to-day -day management that we can streamline processes develop leadership training programs, implement robust performance management, and better partner for personnel concerns, improve the response times, and ultimately enhance the quality of service that we provide to the staff and the citizens they serve. Also, the strategic priorities that this new position aligns with our strategic objectives of leadership and staff development an enhanced employee value proposition for improved recruitment and retention strategies, and demonstrating our commitment to proactive planning and resource allocation, as well as efficiency and effectiveness. The establishment of this position will contribute to the overall efficiency and effectiveness of our organization by ensuring that resources are allocated optimally and tasks are performed by individuals with the necessary skills and expertise. And most importantly, succession planning. So the long-term sustainability investing in this position is not just about addressing immediate needs, but also about laying the, the groundwork for long-term sustainability and succession planning. So I do respectfully request that the commissioners would approve this position and for the financial impact in 2024 budget, that that would be $956.80. So the motion could read, move to approve a new position of senior HR manager at DBM C51, and that would be at 2,973.60 biweekly, and to authorize human resources to update the position listing. And I do have, um, a plan in place that I would like to promote somebody into this position, which I will speak with you about that in executive session. Thank you, Carol. Is there any questions for Carol? Mr. Chair. Mr. Lester. Carol, as I'm understanding, this basically is a, is a position that would clearly identify who your deputy or succession planning, I, I, I get that one. Um, how is your current deputy determined? Do you, Maybe I should ask you, you even have a current deputy. Maybe I'm just unaware. So uh, do you have a current, and how is that identified now versus what this will do? Technically, we do not have a current deputy. We have an HR generalist, which that the functions of an HR generalist are more specialized, like with benefits, et cetera. So it is not a deputy level position. And for succession planning, as you indicated, that is something that our HR department does need to have in place. Mr. Mr. Drews. I'd make the motion to approve a new position of senior HR manager at DBM C51, $2,973.60 biweekly, and authorize human resources to update the position listing. Second. Moved by Drews, seconded by Rosconnect. My comment is, is I appreciate the planning and the thought of restructuring it because I think we all need to think uh, in the future for Pennington County, and I think this is a key element, and so I support it. Mr. Chair, Mr. Mr. My comment would be, you know, we've done some major restructuring in human resources, and I would like to, you know, a year from now say it's working, and this is why it's working. Show us some data that's saying now that we've done this, this is we're seeing some results as far as retention and hiring new employees. Definitely, and I can appreciate that, Commissioner Ross Connect, that in the presentation on July 8th, I'm going to bring forward some of that information, but as you can see, our risk manager position, for example, that we have recently uh, brought on board in the last year, the, just the tremendous efforts that have been 
moving the county forward in the right direction as far as risk management. So, um, yes. Well, I, I totally agree with the risk. Yeah, totally agree. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Next, you. Thank you, Carol. Next is item 23, item from the public. And I do not have no speaker request forms. So that brings us up to, we need to take about a 10 minute recess for planning to set up. So I'd look for a motion to- a Motion. Second. Mo moved by Drew, seconded by Laster for a 10 minute break. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. At this time, I'd look for a motion to come out of recess. So move. Moved by Lasseter, Second. seconded by Drews. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. We're gonna come up to items from planning and zoning. Uh, the commission utilizes speaker request form, so if you'd like to speak on any item, please complete a speaker request form located at the back shelf of the chambers and return commission manager, Holly Hennies, located at the lower right side of the dais. If you are the applicant or the applicants uh, agent, you don't need a speaker request form. Cody. Uh, Cody oh, we need, uh, need a motion to go into Board of Adjustments. So moved. Second. Moved by Laster, seconded by Drews. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now. Uh, Cody Sack, Environmental Planner. Item A is variant COVA 24-0003. It's to allow a detached uh, structure or garage to be located in the front yard of a lot consisting less than one acre in size. Uh, the applicant and landowners, Michael and Jill Allen, I do believe they're in the audience if there's any questions. Uh, location is 10532 Ashwood Court, involves, involves 0.6 acres. Uh, current zoning is suburban residential and existing land use is residential. Access is off Ashwood Court and there is no special flood hazard area on the property. Uh, when reviewing variances, we take a two-prong approach uh, for prong number one, whether granting the variance runs counter to public interest. Uh, the answers are on the screen. It does not appear that the request would run uh, counter to public interest. And prong number two, whether a special condition exists to grant a variance. Uh, it does appear that there is a special condition that would exist on the property. Uh, the property is surrounded by right-of-way on both sides. Uh, so therefore, even if you put the garage in what would be considered their backyard, it's still by our ordinance considered the front yard. And if you were to put it on the side, you would run into a, a variance need for a setback. Um, uh, this was well enough for interdepartment review. There were no objections or concerns that were received. Uh, the applicants are proposing to build a 24 by 30 Ford detached garage. Uh, the subject property has two frontages, uh, therefore has two front yards, and the majority of the property would be located in what is considered the front yard. And again, if the applicants were to construct the garage on the side, it would encroach into the required setbacks. Uh, staff has received several letters opposing this request. Uh, however, staff does recommend approval of variant COVA 24-0003, as there is a special condition that exists on the property that would create a hardship, and staff would recommend uh, three conditions be added. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Cody. Mr. Laster. Cody, can you kind of show on the map up there what is considered both the front yard? Because you said technically they have two front yards. Yeah, so the the way our ordinance reads, if you, any, any um, uh, property line that abuts right away is considered a, a frontage or a front yard. So their front yard would be considered off of Ashwood Court would be this property line right here. And then this Wheaton Road in the back. So this whole area behind the house and right here in front of the house would be considered a frontage per our ordinance. So that which is um, just, no, go down, 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 down. So that still, so frontage because of the highway, frontage because of where their front door is and that they basically have a, an all around front yard. Correct, yes. And then in the in the back here too is their septic system. Uh, so to put a garage on top of the septic, um, it, you're not allowed to do that. And then to put a garage here on what would be considered the side yard, you would encroach into the eight foot required setback. And is there, not an ordinance, but is there a reason why putting it in the front yard? Is there like a, a neighborhood 
issue or is it our ordinance or what's... So our ordinance doesn't allow a an accessory structure in the front yard for a lot that's under one acre if it's zoned a residential uh, zoning designation. But that hardship basically says their whole house, their whole property is a front yard. So now you've got to take that into consideration. Correct. Gotcha. I just wanted to make sure I understood the layout and the public understands it too. So okay. thank you. Any further questions for Cody? As he said, there was a couple of concerns brought in. I don't have no speaker request forms on this item. The applicant in the audience, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, there are you'd have to come up and identify yourself for the record. Okay, I am Jill Allen. Um, there are other places in the neighborhood that have garages in their front yards, and I do have pictures of those for you. And the fact that I'd like to have a garage out front there is that from the hill all the way down to that cul-de-sac, the water runs that way, and I'd like to put a curb down that runs over to the valley to the west to keep the water from coming down into it's, our property. It's a hill is what it is, and that's why we can't have it attached, is because the water wouldn't be able to drain. Okay. Are there the any garage. questions for? The no. garage would go right here in this area right here. Okay. Right there. And actually, these lines are not correct. This line should be about right over here. Yeah, and then they're straight, not. straight back to Right in here. Okay. Because we already have survey survey pins that are there. Too bad it surveyed and it yeah. actually well, brings it over. It in. Yeah. There's yeah. Pins in the ground. So, but there's a lot of water that comes down this road, and I'd like to head it off, which would be the garage, and then I could run a curb going back this way, which runs into a valley that goes down this way. You can't see the valley from the no, there's top a, view. There is a culvert yeah. down there, but you can't yeah, the see the culvert. culvert the culvert's either. right in this area right here. Okay. Is there any questions from the commission for Michael or Jill? Mr. Chair. Mr. Las or <laughs> Mr. Mr. Roskinen. Move to approve COBA 24-003 with three conditions as there is a special condition that exists on the property that would create a hardship. Second. Moved by Roskinex, seconded by Laster. Any further discussion? Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. It's been approved. Thank you. Thank you. One thing, I, our next two items, I do want to say, you know, Board of Adjustments takes a super majority to approve any item, which is four uh, positive votes. And as you can see, we only have four <coughs> commissioners here today. So I just want to make that clear to uh, the applicants that are in the audience. You have the opportunity or the choice to continue on today. Are you can ask for a continuance till we have a full board. That's up to your discretion. I just wanted to make that make you aware that it takes a super majority for a board of adjustments. Cody. Uh, Cody Sack, Environmental Planner. Item B is variant COVA 24-0005. It's to allow a lot size less than 6,500 square feet in the suburban residential zoning district. The applicant and landowner is Nicole Herber. Uh, the agent is Tui Design Group. Location of the property is 630 and in Drive. Involves 1.2 acres. Uh, current zoning suburban residential district with an existing land use of residential. Access is up in and Drive, and there's no special flood hazard here on the property. Uh, again, uh, we take a two-prong approach when approving variances. Uh, whether granting variance runs counter to public interest, uh, it does not appear that it would run counter to public interest. And prong number two, whether a special condition exists to grant the variance, uh, it does not appear that there is a special condition that would uh, warrant a variance. Uh, on the property, there is a single family residence and a detached garage that was built in 2017. This was right around for the Department of Review. No objections or concerns were received. 
Uh, the applicant is requesting to allow a 6,061 square foot lot to be zoned suburban residential district. Uh, the existing lot has been under 6,500 square feet since it was platted in 1980. Uh, the applicant acquired the additional 754 square feet of land through adverse possession and therefore is plotting the land together. Uh, the existing detached garage currently does not meet the required 8-foot setback to the rear, uh, rear lot line and encroaches over the lot line. Uh, the variance would allow the applicant to continue the plotting process, which would resolve the setback issue. Uh, staff is recommending denial of variance UV 24-0005 as there's no special uh, no special conditions that exist on the property that would excuse literal enforcement of Pennington County Zoning Ordinance PCZO. Uh, however, if the board adjustment disagrees, staff would add one condition. Mr. Chair. Mr. Lester. I just have one clarification and it might make it pretty easy for all of us. Uh, item E in the analysis says this variance would allow the applicant to continue the platting process which would resolve the setback issue. Mm -hmm. So your recommendation and everything is ultimately if we give this variance it's going to allow them to complete their platting process so that they can rectify the problem that's there. Correct. So, so staff had a, a hard time with this one. It went back and forth on whether recommending approval or recommending denial. Uh, we recommended denial to stay consistent with what we have. Um, but the, basically what happened was back in 2017, there's a, a fence line that they based their, um, that's been there for a long time and that's what they based their property line off of and what they thought their property line was. Uh, however, when they went to uh, sell the house, I believe they're working on selling the house, uh, when the mortgage survey was done, that, pro that garage is actually over what the actual property line is. Uh, so they went through the process of adverse possession, got that land, and now they're platting it together through the city. Mr. Chair. Sounds, sounds pretty easy for me. Okay. Mr. Roskinick. I guess my comment would be, and I will support this variance, and that's because there was some extra effort uh, for the applicant to acquire another 754 square feet to bring up the 6,061 square feet, which is you know pretty darn close to 6,500 square feet. And also a lot of the lots in that subdivision, that they all suffer from just being, if I read it right, it's 0.12 acres. And you know, it's hard to do a lot of stuff with 0.12 acres. Correct, and there are several Actually, the majority of the lots on that property are under the 65, or in that neighborhood are under the 6,500 square feet for suburban residential. Sure. Mr. Drews. So, Cody, did you say the, this area was platted in 1980? Yeah, so this, the, the original lot, um, so the lot line, it's kind of hard to tell, it goes here, or for the rear lot line is right here. Um, all the lots in that area, or the majority, I guess I didn't view all of them, uh, were platted in 1980 was when that area of that subdivision was platted, uh, which was prior to our ordinance requiring 6,500 square feet. Yeah, I'm going to support this also. Yeah. Any further questions of Cody? I do have a speaker request for him. I'll recognize, I'll call up Tammy and Mark. Tammy Johnson, Mark Cohen. You just need to recognize or identify yourself for the record and then. <coughs> Mark Cohen, um, I'm an attorney representing Tammy Johnson. Tammy Johnson. So <coughs> we're here because we are part of those properties need to that. Bring the mic down so oh, we can. That are being affected by this subdivision that's going up behind us. We, when we bought our house, we were represented that that was our property. We have maintained that property. We have improved those properties. And a lot of us have structures that fall within that area there. And I've been there since 98. And Annan was who owned the property behind us, was well aware. He never objected to us. In fact, one of our neighbors even talked to him and he was fine with us being on that property. Now we're in the now we're looking to lose a lot of property of our, of our property. So we think that we have a grandfather clause that allows us to keep our property. Okay, so Tam, let me try to understand what's happening. When they said they were acquired the other 724 square feet, that was 
the fence line the, the fence line had to be moved if, if, if I'm trying to gather up all the information. Well, he bought, Jerry, who owned that, owns that property, bought a section to save his garage back there so he didn't have to tear it down. In my opinion, the developer back there is using bully tactics because they basically told him that he could not keep that property, but under statute, is it 13, uh, what is it, 1321? Or what is our statute numbers? Basically, yeah, says adverse we, possession. Yeah, so adverse possession, we shouldn't have to buy that. And he was swindled, and in my opinion, swindled into buying it because they kept telling him, no, no, no. And, and then upon that, after he bought it, they told him, don't tell anybody you did this. Keep it secret. Don't tell anybody until after July 15th. What July 15th holds, I don't know. But I, you know, if he's allowed to do this, if they're allowed to do this with this property, they're going to come and they're going to hit each one of us. And so since they allowed him to buy a section of his property, if his neighbor says, no, we don't want to buy ours, if that's the way it's going to go, are they going to take the houses and stack them in like bricks? I mean, it doesn't make sense here what's going on. We should be grandfathered in to keep our property. He never should have had to pay for his section of property, in my opinion. So Tammy, I'm I'm just trying to get this straight. You know, this is someone who's trying to fix something that's on their property, and I understand your opposition of them having to buy it and so forth. But, but you're saying that other properties aren't going to be in the same position, exactly. Which ends up being more of a civil. There's a lot of civil case than it is for the, the county commission case, but. I mean, I, I appreciate you guys coming forward and, and bringing this to our attention, but but this applicant, you're not opposed to this applicant doing what they're they're doing, correct? You're just you're identifying that there is a problem out there, and quite frankly, this commission can't take action on that. But this applicant brought this forward because of the work that they're doing. Perhaps, perhaps, Commissioner. Um, our question, I think, is process-oriented <clears throat> in that with that first map that was up there. Uh, Cody wanted to go ahead. And... I'm just going to say just a little bit before Cody gets started. I think a lot of this could be uh, if you would go up to the planning department and sit down with them and go through what your concerns are, then we that to help us all be a little more prepared for what's in. Certainly, and I heard somebody, I think, I think it was here, uh, an application for adverse possession. So it sounded to me like, that's, that was my question in part of like, okay, what paperwork do we do to be properly situated to? I so, uh, Cody Stack and Roman Defender, adverse possession is not decided by the county. It's decided by the courts. Yeah. So anything to do with adverse possession, you would have to go through the legal process over at the courts. I don't know what that process is. Um, I hope Alexa doesn't tar feather me for saying anything <laughs> wrong. Um, but basically, any of that concern would be civil. Uh, if if you think that you have an adverse possession case, it's a civil it's a civil issue between you and that other property owner, uh, and the courts would decide it. As for platting, all the platting is done in that area is done through the city of Rapid City. So any of those concerns would need to be actually addressed with the city of Rapid City during that platting process whenever they do plot that property. Does that does that help you folks? I believe so. I think I think what I'm hearing is that again, a lot of these lots have <laughs> structures that are that fence line he mentioned was the historical marker everybody used, all of them. And it's significant. So I think a lot of them have structures, uh, a, a number of things back there. It seems to me the issue isn't even ripe, I guess, until a developer comes along and says, well, we're moving your stuff. I, you know, um, they can't do it. Um, uh, if, the part, if the landowner asserts adverse possession at that point. But... Um, so maybe it's, so maybe these other lots aren't right. The issue, you know, to your and point, each, each property owner is responsible for their own knowing where their lot lines are. Okay. 
you know, I, he found his out by doing a sale and found out it was moved. It was actually further over than where the fence was. So that's, this is quite a bit different. I mean, that happens quite frankly, people put up fences and they go by those lines. He actually had, uh, <clears throat> had it done and found out it was further over. The pins were further over, so. Well, well in this case, the fence was the seller's uh, fence. And this, and the, the, and she told all these people that their line went that far. Yeah. Now we have a developer coming. That's why in, we survey working is. off of the of the yeah. You know, of the, this. Surveys is a very important thing to get done. Mr. Chair. Mr. Master. I'm going to concur. Whenever we bought our land, we made sure we had a survey of it before, so you know what you're getting. But I have a follow-up question for <coughs> Cody. <laughs> uh, Cody, I understand you may not know this answer, but is there a drainage ditch back there? Is that kind of what that adverse possession is? Is because it's a drainage ditch back there and they were able to buy that off? Or, I mean, kind of what was the conditions on that? Do you even know? Uh, I'm not sure. I know that they submitted something from the court decision and I believe it's in the packet, but I didn't, I didn't read, th read through it. Um, generally on the back of all property lines, there's a minor drainage utility easement. I, I, I should I don't know if I actually included it in the packet, but they did submit it um, for adverse possession um, that was decided and determined by the court and the lot line that you see here um, in, in blue is what the court determined to be the new lot line of, of the property. Uh, but again, that's a separate process outside of anything done by the county or even the city. Um, right. It's a civil thing. Yeah, I mean, it falls under SQCL 15 something or other. And it's 20 years. I mean, there's a whole process for it. Gotcha. I just want to follow up. Sorry. Mr. Chair. Mr. So, Cody, do you know how many properties are impacted by this? You know? uh, affected by what could be considered adverse right. possession? I am not sure. Um, <clears throat> If, if you go along this line of problems, it, it could affect any one of these lots in here, but I wouldn't, wouldn't know. It all depends. There's, there's a bunch of different um, aspects of adverse possession, and that's why it's determined by the courts and what, they, what their criteria is for adverse possession, and I don't, I don't know those, so I wouldn't be able to count okay. lots of them for it. Do you know if that... The land behind is all acquired by one developer? Uh, the land behind is owned by one developer, yes. Who is that developer? Could you tell me? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I do know it's owned by one. If you go up, if you went upstairs after this meeting, they'd be able to click on it Thank and you. show you who it was. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Seems like that might be the more efficient way. I can tell you <clears throat> right off the top of my head, I know of 13 houses that are least affected by this. 13 houses. Now, if you look at Dealer's Drive there, the way that property line goes, that house that's not next to the house in the subject property, but across Dealer Drive, that house, the property line goes basically up to their back patio. So when the development went in, they didn't, they didn't build according to the property lines. I mean, the property line basically goes right up to their back patio. So, I mean, it's just, it's a mess, and I don't know how many people it's affecting, I'm guessing, where it cuts back out and then goes again, where you have the green highlighted lines. Those are probably okay, but everybody below that line, at least down to, uh, what is it, Pinnacle Drive there, every house is affected. I, I gain to lose, or I don't gain, but I, I look to lose a third of my backyard, a big portion of it. I have a permanent structure back there. I have horseshoe pits. I got a garden. I got a fence. I mean, I have almost 30 years built up back in that backyard of maintaining it. So, Tammy, it sounds to me this applicant had to do what probably what you need to do is what you identified you have to do and I think Cody explained that this is civil and part of the city so am I correct the city planning so that would be a, a step for you to go down to the, and have this discussion with the rapid city planning uh, so I'm trying to help him out Cody yes yeah, so Cody Sack environmental planner um, 
I, they could go talk to the city. I don't know what the city's going to say. They're probably going to say the same thing we're going to say is that it's yeah. a it's an adverse possession claim that you're trying to make. It's done through the court system. That's what you need to do. All we're doing here is um, we're verifying that a lot size meets the requirement or is getting a variance and that the setbacks of the property are, are there. That's the only thing we do. Anything with adverse possession like you're talking about needs to be handled outside of of the county in this in this meeting, to be honest. And so, Tammy, did, have you had a <clears throat> survey done on your property yet? When you bought the property, probably. Um, so that, I think that's your first step into going to the courts is having a survey and done. But this item here today is on a for the application. And, and I realize that, but when we all got certified letters, I had to question everybody got a certified letter. We have a homeowners association that's not active, which could be yeah. reactivated at any point. And so I wondered if it had to do why everybody got certified letters because of the homeowner association. So I, the reason why I'm here is because this is my first step in trying to figure out what's going on back behind us. Yeah. So if it's already affected this property, how's it going to affect my property? I'll let Cody... Okay, so Cody Sack of Urban Planner. I just want to clarify that this has nothing right now. I, I don't know any developer plans or anything to develop that. That's through the city or Rapid City. If they know anything, you can talk to them. The reason why we're going through this process today is because this person was trying to sell a house. Their garage was over the lot line. Yeah. The person couldn't get a mortgage or no one to give them a mortgage since the property wasn't on their or the structure wasn't on their property. So they went through the courts for adverse possession won that claim and now they're plotting it through the city of rapid city and since they're plotting it we have to look at lot size their lot size doesn't mean our 75 or 6500 square foot minimum so that's why we're here today you got a notice letter because anytime a variance is done you're required to notify any neighbor within 500 feet that's th thank you for the clarification because really we're taking up a lot of the applicants time here on on your issue. Now, I understand your issue, but I think, you know, have a conversation with the applicant and he can tell you what he had to do to, to fix oh, it. I've so, had many okay. conversations with them and okay. it just seems like the, the deal that's going on between them and the developer seems very fishy to me, especially when there's a hush hush and it's like, so I have to do my due diligence and come down here and at least try to figure out what's going on here, you know. Okay. Because you can't, I mean, nobody, when he started this whole process, he would go to the county, he would go there, and everybody would say, we don't know, we don't know. And so, you know, somebody's got to have an answer for us what's going on. And this was my first step to find out maybe I can glean something here to figure out what's going on and how my property is going to be affected. So that's why I'm here okay. today. Well, thanks, Tammy. You, you at least shed some light on us so we, we don't. Mr. Chair. Mr. Ruskin. Cody, if, uh, if I was there on that east lot line of the subject property, what's the, uh, that undeveloped property, is, is that, uh, what's the topography? Uh, I, I believe it's pretty flat. I, I haven't been out there to, to look at that back side. Um, whether it's going to be developed or not, like I said, I don't. I do not know. I just wondered how so the, the usability of that property to the east was. Okay. <clears throat> Is the applicant here, Nicole? Did she want to say anything? Otherwise, I'll go to the board. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve COVA. 24-005 with one condition. And I think the reason why is I just think back in 1980, there's a lot of some mistakes made in the planning process and it's causing this particular hardship. That's my okay. take on it. I just moved by Ross Connect, seconded by Drews to approve with one condition. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, folks, for being here. Oh, this one 
We have somebody in by Zoom. Let me reiterate what I had said earlier, Cody. Um, who do we have on Zoom? Could you please, do you hear me? Hi, yes, I hear you. My name is Allison Maltese. I, I missed the first name. Allison. 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 Okay. Yeah. Allison, I'm going to repeat because you might not have been on at the beginning, but we are a short one commissioner, and in, in the Board of Adjustments, you need a supermajority approval uh, to pass anything. So that means you have to have the full, full support of the four commissioners here. So what I do is I give you, I, I bring that to your attention. I, and if you choose to want to continue to uh, the next meeting when we have a full commission, you have that option. Or you okay. can move forward today and, and do that. You can make that decision at any time. You can, Great. Cody can present, you can present, and questions can be asked. And then if you decide you want to continue, you can do that. Okay. okay. I appreciate it. With that, I'll turn it over to Cody. Uh, Cody Sack, Environmental Planner. Item C is Subdivision Regulation Variant COSV 24-0004. It's to waive the requirement not to construct additional water storage for domestic use and fire protection. Uh, the applicant and landowner is Dean and Allison Maltese. Uh, located at the end of Eleanor Drive, it involves 4.55 acres. Uh, current zoning is Planning and Development District. Uh, existing land use will be or is vacant. Access is off Eleanor Drive, and there is no special special flood hazard area on the property. Again, when we look at variances, we take a two-prong approach. Uh, for prong number one, uh, whether the variance runs counter to public interest, uh, it doesn't appear that it would be uh, counter to public interest. And then prong number two, whether a special condition exists to grant a variance. Uh, it doesn't appear that a special condition would exist to prevent uh, additional water storage um, from being added. Uh, currently, the lot is vacant of any structures. Vacation of plat COVPL 24-0005 uh, to vacate plat notes 7, 8, 9, 13, and 14 of Mountain Meadow Subdivision will be heard later at this meeting. Uh, this was right around for interdepartment review. Uh, there were no major objections or concerns that were received. Uh, just a little history, the Board of Adjustments seen this, um, I believe, six times now. Um, back when the subdivision was platted, they put notes on the plat after a certain amount of building permits were hit, 65. Uh, surety needed to be um, submitted and then um, water storage needed to be increased to 95,000 gallons. Uh, to vacate those notes off the plat, which is the process that they're going through, uh, they have to get this uh, subdivision regulation variance. And again, the Board of Adjustment has approved six previous requests not to construct the additional water storage. Uh, so with that, staff does uh, recommend denial of subdivision regulation variant COSV 24-0004, as there is no special condition that exists. Uh, if, the board of, uh, if the Board of Adjustment disagrees and decides to approve the request, staff would add the uh, one condition. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Cody. Uh, Travis. Uh, Cody, I just want to make sure, yeah, I, I, this one pops up and... What is the standard? We typically deny it, but they're going to build a home with their own. So, so typically, um, what the board's uh, board of adjustments done in the past was the the first request that came in, um, they requested to um, not do the water storage and not do the fire sprinkler system in the house. Um, the board agreed to um, not make them a do additional water storage as long as they kept the fire sprinkler system in the house. Um, so that's the direction that we've been going ever since. Um, so that's what they're requesting today as well. And follow up. So this is in line with what we've established. Is this in line as far as approving or denying it in its current current state? Um, so the, the board has a, um, approved this specific request um, six other times now, just as as is. To as, not, as is with your recommendation, stuff. if we decide to approve it. Correct, yes. Okay, that's all I wanted to make sure, that we're being consistent across the board. Same one. No, if, we, if we do it same, it would be the same as the other sex. Exactly all I was trying to get at. Okay. Any further Mr. questions? Mr. Uh, is this one on the Southern Hills water system, or is it got a private well? I believe that this one would be on Southern Hills water. 
Um, if Southern Hills Water, like for the other lots that aren't attached to Southern Hills Water, uh, they do have the option to drill a well as well. So if we were to approve this today, it'd be consistent with what we've done in the past with other lots up there. Correct. And I think we all admit that putting notes on a plat can be pretty confusing, especially when you go into another administration and uh, the engineer is no longer in, in business. So, you know, we inherited what a mess. So I'll probably support this request. Thanks, Ron. And I and I, I think I would too would be consistent with what we've done in the past. Any further questions for Cody? Allison? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have I'm any? good. You're good. Okay. Yeah. I'll go to the board. Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. I make a motion to approve um, the request with the one um, with the one condition that the subdivision regulation variant COS V24-0004 only apply to lot three, block three of Mountain Meadows subdivision as it is in line with what we've done consistently in this area since we've identified this as a problem and have figured a way to navigate through it. I'll second that motion. Moved by Laster, seconded by Ross Connect for approval with one condition. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Allison. Thank Move. you. Move to adjourn the Board of Adjustment and reconvene as the Board of Commission. Second. Moved by Laster, seconded by Drews to adjourn the Board of Adjustments. So all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Brittany, now we come to the consent agenda. Good morning, Commissioners. Brittany Molitor, Planning Director. The Board of Commissioners uses a consent agenda to act on non-controversial and routine planning and zoning items. The consent agenda is acted upon by one motion and vote of the Board. Items may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a Board member or a citizen. The consent agenda for planning and zoning contains the following item. Item D is Planning and Development Overlay Review PUR 2120 for Chase and Leslie Larson to review a plan unit development overlay to allow a specialty resort. And Planning Commission concurred with staff's recommendation and recommended approval of PUR 2120 with 19 conditions. Thank you, Brittany. At this time, is there any members of the public want, nobody left, want an item removed? Seeing none, any commissioners want uh, anything from the consent agenda removed? Seeing none, I'd look for a motion. Mr. Chair, Mr. move to approve the planning and zoning consent agendas presented. Moved by Roskinek. Second. Second by Laster. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we come up to the uncontested hearings and the following planning and zoning matters in our uncontested hearings are those of which planning department has not yet received or provided comments contesting the item. The documents for each item have been reviewed by the commissioners and decisions during these hearings will be made based on the information <coughs> provided in the packet and a short presentation. If we receive comment contesting items, the matter will be addressed in the same manner as contested hearing. Cody. Uh, Chris Hacker, Environmental Planner. Item E is vacation of plat COVPL 24 0005. Uh, the request is to vacate plat notes 7, 8, 9, 13, and 14 for lot 3, block 3, Mount Meadow subdivision. Uh, the applicant and landowner is Dean and Allison Maltese. Uh, the location of the property is at the end of Eleanor Drive. Again, it's zone planning, planning development, and it's vacant of any structures. Uh, this was read around for your partner review. No objections or concerns were received. Um, again, the Board of Commissioners has approved this request um, six other times, uh, but it was only to approve with vacating notes 7, 9, 13, and 14. Uh, note 8 was left on all the previous requests. Uh, so staff is recommending approval of vacation of plant COVPL 24 005 uh, with two conditions uh, with the planning commission's concurrence. Any questions for Cody? Seeing none, I come to the board for a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Drews. Move to approve COVPL 24 0005 with the two conditions. Second. Moved by Drew, seconded by Roskinect. 
Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Contested hearings, F. Uh, item F is vacation of section line right of way, COVS 24 0001. It's to vacate approximately 1,126 uh, feet of section line right of way between sections 16 and 21, Township 1 South, uh, Range 7E. The applicant and landowner is Morris Evans and Brian Evans. Uh, location of the property is south of the intersection of Windmill Road and Neck Yoke Road along Neck Yoke Road. <laughs> Uh, currently, it's vacant of any structures. Uh, again, access is off Neck Yoke Road, and there's no special flood hazard area on the property. Uh, this was right for Energy Department review. Uh, the county highway came back and said an approach permit must be filed with the highway department. Uh, the highway department is opposed to vacating any section line that does not serve the public's best interest. Uh, no other objections or concerns were received. Again, the applicants are requesting to vacate approximately 1,126 feet of a section line right away. Uh, so on the map, it runs the length of their property. Uh, so they're looking to vacate just this portion. Uh, it does appear to, that all properties in the area do have legal access, and this portion of section line does not provide access to any uh, property. Uh, it does appear... Uh, through a picture or through the through the site visit, this drops off. So this is the section line looking west. It does drop off there. Uh, so it does appear that topography could limit a road being constructed within the section line. And they, but the applicants do have the ability to relocate the section line. Uh, staff did some additional research uh, since the staff report was written on uh, the section line on this property. Um, so two properties over to the west uh, was vacated in 2017. Uh, so there was a portion along the section line that was already vacated. Um, other than that, all the properties to the west for over a mile do have legal access that aren't taken off of this section line. Um, staff does recommend to deny the vacation of section line right away. COVS 24-01 is there's the option to relocate the section line. Uh, but if the Board of Commissioners disagrees and approves the request, staff would add one condition. Mr. Chair. Mr. Roskinek. My take on this, I would support the request, and the reason why is because whether you relocate it or you vacate it, you're still just going to other private property. If that was public property, I could totally see, you know, we... We need to provide that access. That's what section lines were for, utilities and access. So beans is a, beans is a private lot. Uh, either technique is still taking you to a piece of private property, which uh, I don't see any. But another reason is that we all know the relocated section line, you need roughly 400 signatures. And I think that's a burden on, on the taxpayer. And I think we were trying to work uh, in the future where uh, to relocate a section line would be the same requirements to vacate a section line, which you just need two or three signatures from adjacent property owners. So, as <clears throat> because this uh, section line only would benefit, uh, allow public access to a private uh, lot, I just don't, uh, I can't support the, I mean, I can support the request, but that's my rationale. Any other questions? Mr. Chair. Mr. Lester. Cody, that property directly to the west, is there a house or anything on that one? Yes, there is. Um, uh, let's see if I can get a better. So there's a house that's located right there. Right. So basically, if we vacated that section line, it's, it's going through another private property, but then it hits another roadway for access. And correct me if I'm wrong, you did say that property there does not have the um, section line. Correct. This property vacated the section line in 2017, uh, number 1703. So ultimately, I don't see a, a personal reason for that for <clears throat> for private or for public access because you're not accessing public lands. You're only traveling through public lands to another road. So, and there's not a a, a, a um, congestion area in there with multiple units where you got to be able to give access maybe in the future by putting a road there so they can have an access out. So I think I'm in concurrence that we can vacate this particular one. Correct. And the, the current or the closest public land from going west from that section line is over a mile away right there. 
it would be this lot. This is the first forest service lot you hit. And you still can't access it because you got to jump through that property that has it vacated on it already. Correct. You'd, You'd be more to come likely to come up Coyote Flats, yep. park there, and then go over. But there's also another section line, not on the screen that you can see, that also accesses it from Neck Yoke Road. Yep. Okay. Go to the board for a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Roskinek. Uh, just based on my conversation, I'd go ahead. My motion would be to approve COVS 24-01 uh, for the reasons I explained. Okay, and I think there is one condition that all necessary resolution exhibits vacating the section line right away be recorded to the Register of Deeds Office by the applicant. With that one condition. Okay. And, and seconded by Lasseter. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Brittany. Good morning again, Commissioners. Brittany Molitor. Item G is Ordinance Amendment OA24-06 for Pennington County to amend Section 900A Road Improvements and Design Standards to amend and supersede the existing Section 900A for Road Improvements and Design Standards of the Pennington County Subdivision Regulations. And the reason for this update is uh, for clarification of the applicability of road districts. Um, we're just proposing um, this uh, this situation came up um, during a subdivision regulation variance hearing uh, where it was in a road district. Um, so the proposed te text now will say that if the road district levies taxes and has standards um, within their district, then their standards would stay. Um, if they do not have standards, then Ordinance 14 would apply. So it's just a clarification. Okay. Any questions? And the so Planning Commission did recommend approval. Okay. Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. Move to approve Ordinance Amendment OA 24-06. Moved by Lasseter. Seconded by LaCroix. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item H is Ordinance Amendment OA 24-07 for Pennington County to amend Section 1500C sewer facilities to amend and supersede the existing Section 1500C sewer facilities of the Pennington County Subdivision Regulations. This was to update the section reference to the correct section of the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance. It's just basically a housekeeping measure. Um, so staff and the Planning Commission did recommend approval. Any questions for Brittany? Go to the board for motion. Yes, Chair. Mr. Drews. Move approval of um, ordinance amendment uh, OA24-08. <coughs> second. Moved by Drews, seconded by Lasseter. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Item I is Ordinance Amendment OA24-08 for Pennington County to amend Section 1703-H, Certificates for Plates, Minor Plates, and Lot Line Adjustment Plates, to amend and supersede the existing Section 1703-H, Certificates for Plates, Minor Plates, and Lot Line Adjustment Plates of the Pennington County Subdivision Regulations. Um, the reason for this amendment was to simplify the certificate for road districts and add a certificate for roads that cross federal lands. Um, this came about in several of our plats. We were working with uh, a couple of the surveyors, um, and it was difficult in certain road district instances to actually match the actual certificate with what the road district does. Um, so we worked with the surveyors to update this language. Um, so it was more fitting um, for our current situations. Um, so it's so you could be the highway superintendent or the road district. Uh, previously, we required uh, more information with the road district, like the meeting date 
um, and some different things, and that necessarily may not have happened. Um, so they were having difficulty actually meeting the certificate requirements, um, the language. So we did work with the surveyors and came up with um, this certificate in lieu of. Yes, Chair. Mr. Drews. Uh, I believe I misspoke on my previous motion. I think that should have been 24-07, and I said 24-08. Um, let's deal with this one and then we'll go back. Okay. You think we're okay? I think we're okay. We knew which one he was on and which, what the intent was. Okay. And he just he clarified it. So good. Okay. Any questions for Brittany on item I? And then one other um, certificate that was added was the access to federal lands. Um, we do have instances in places where there are special use permits or there are, um, numbered vehicular traffic um, roads that are through the Forest Service. So we do want to indicate that on the plats um, as their legal access. Um, so we did add that as a certificate. And these so, certificates will be filed with Register of Deeds? Correct. Okay. These are part of the certificates that are filed on the plats. Um, so Planning Commission and staff did recommend approval of this okay. ordinance amendment. Any questions for Brittany? Seeing so none, I'd look for a motion. Mr. Chair, move to approve ordinance amendment OA 24-08. Moved, moved by Rosknecht, seconded by Drews. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Next, that brings us up to item number 25, item from Commission Manager Holly Hennies. Uh, commissioners, these are the two resolutions that the board asked to have prepared for consideration at this meeting. Um, if approved by this body today, they will be forwarded to the Black Hills Association of County Commissioners for consideration. Um, if successful, they are moved on to the State Association. Uh, first one in front of you today is for consideration is approval of the resolution for revenue sources for South Dakota counties. Is there any questions for Brittany? I'm Holly. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Brittany. Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. Move to approve the resolution seeking additional revenue sources for South Dakota counties to reduce their dependence upon property taxes. Moved by Lasseter. Seconded by LaCroix. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now, the second one in front of you for consideration is to amend South Dakota Codified Law 31-3-6, which is the petition to relocate, change, or vacate a highway. Mr. Roskinek, do you have any comment on this? Uh, no. Mr. Chair. Mr. Laster. I just would like some clarification. Is this basically saying that the property owners can have it vacated with a very small number or is it still they can get it on our agenda with a small number of signatures i guess that's what i wanted to make sure i understood looks like there and britney's got the answer <laughs> yes. now, now i can say britney <laughs> okay <laughs> yes um so this came about because in the statute in a 2020 or 2021 they changed it to allow a vacation um with two-thirds of the surrounding property owners or all three if there's three or less, or all of the property owners if there's three or less. However, in order to relocate a section line, you would need 1% of the voters in the gubernatorial election. So that's about 471 signatures to relocate. The rationale for it, um, even from our perspective, and we have been working with Commissioner Ross Connect on this, is that in order to relocate a section line, you would have to have the approval of the surrounding property owners because you either need to relocate it on the existing property or a surrounding property. By getting signatures, you're not actually getting the the approval from the people that are really impacted from it. Not only that, um, staff and the board really can't relocate a section line onto another person's property without their permission. Um, so it really, the statute didn't make sense. It would actually make more sense to require the signatures to vacate because that impacts the public as a whole. Um, so we were just um, recommending to change that 
um, to allow the relocation with the surrounding property owners because it makes more sense. Mr. Chair, I think the one are item. You, are, are you done, Travis? I'm good, yeah. Okay. I think the one item that we, you know, discussed here a few minutes ago is uh, we're going to see a lot of this in the future. I mean, there's just a lot of lots out in the Black Hills that are encumbered with section lines. And I think it's uh, less adverse if we relocate because then you're still providing access. And, and with that said, and I think it'd be easier for county planning and zoning to, you know, if we're going to see a lot more requests to relocate, then it should be easier to relocate than it should be the vacate because once it's vacated, it's it's uh, finite. So Holly, I thank you for putting this together. Correct. And our highway department does typically not support any vacation of right of way. They like to keep our right of way. So relocating it is more favorable for them as well. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? If not, I'd look for a motion. Move to approve. The resolution seeking to amend South Dakota Code of Fed Law 31-3-6 for a petition to locate, change, or vacate a highway. Moved by Ross, connect, seconded by Drews. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Holly. And I just, nope. Mr. Chair, Sorry. My, I wanted to let the board know at the last commission meeting, Commissioner Hadcock did speak about a resolution for the alcohol, for the liquor tax. Um, we started to work on that, and she had decided that it was it was a pretty big item to tackle and that she needed some more information and wanted to work on it um, more. So we didn't have time to get the resolution for this purpose, but it is something I believe she's going to continue to work okay. on. Okay. Thanks for giving us the update on that one because it, it was brought up too. On yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next, we come to items from chair or commission members. Seeing none, I'd move on to committee reports. Travis. All right, Mr. Chair, Central States Fair and Rodeo. Um, basically, the biggest takeaway from that is we got a fair coming up in August, and then. Um, Probably one of the biggest things that's going to be popping up here in July is the AQHA meeting at the fairgrounds. That's probably going to be a big draw. Um, outside of that, you know, there was conversation about um, budget and policy and bylaws and things of that nature, but nothing major to note unless Mr. Commissioner LaCroix has anything. I believe you were there. Well, was there any big ticket item that jumped out at you on that one? Well, no, there was just some discussion on, you know, on the Kirstoff building's HVAC is going to be a big expense, and and they're going to probably be bringing that at the budget request time. Yeah, that's true. I just, uh, yeah, I guess I put that just as a budget, but yeah, gotcha. Um, let's see here. Um, Weed and Pest Board uh, went to that meeting as well. Uh, there is going to be a meeting at the uh, outdoor campus, and it's dealing with the prairie dog complaint. Um, I think we heard that one here, if I remember correct. I know we heard it in the um, in the Weed and Pest Board, but uh, Tuesday, June 25th, um, congressional staffers will be there for that one because it's dealing with federal lands. It's dealing with property owner losing uh, animals and and things of that nature due to that uh, prairie dog infestation. Outside of that, um, they're looking. They're still waiting for some of their funding for some of their uh, fuel break projects. They're um, they're doing their budget. And they're seeing an increase with the wage study. So their 2025 budget, with the numbers that they've, this is the way I understand it in the meeting, with the numbers that they were have given and gone through, they're going to see just an automatic increase of fifty thousand uh, dollars to their due to the wage um, study numbers. Just so everyone has an update on that one, and uh, they're full staffed on all their crew update for their seasonal workers. Next meeting will be August 14th, and that'll be a field trip meeting. Then let's see here, the uh, building committee meeting agenda. Um, we walked through some of the, um, the projects and some of the new numbers once they got um, a solid um, bid from school construction through their um, construction manager. Um, I don't know if I want to... <laughs> There's going to be some changes that are going to come forward, um, and it's going to be a significant um, hit in our budget, uh, the numbers that they proposed. I don't know if they're public yet or not. Ron, do you remember from that meeting what they were saying it was going to be public? 
Uh, I think I'd hold off on numbers until uh, Brian, you know, wanted to reach out to some other folks. Yeah, he to, wanted to, he wanted to touch base on see stuff. See if we could get some partners. Um, but I'll, if, if those are the numbers that end up coming forward, it's going to be a significant impact, um, not in a positive way for our budget. Correct. And then in the uh, threat manager group meeting, uh, we had a meeting and visited about. Uh, the, the policy and kind of work through with EMS and a lot of the wording and making sure that we weren't being too onerous for um, the staff, but also met the intent of the um, threat management um, policy. So there's still some updates to that and some and some tweaks to the to the language and 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 whatnot on that policy. Outside of that, that was that was it. Thank you, Travis. Mr. Drews? So uh, I was out of town for the library board and the air quality board. Uh, also uh, out of town for the uh, MPO executive policy committee, which I trust that uh, uh, Charlie Croy attended. Yes, I did. But, uh, I did attend a couple <coughs> things. Uh, uh, I attended the retirement uh, for uh, School of Mines President Jim Rankin, uh, Commissioner LaCorea was also there. Uh, good turnout of people. I'm just uh, sorry to see uh, President Rankin uh, leaving at this point in time. I think he's done wonderful things, not only for the uh, school, but for our community and our state uh, while he's there. So just really appreciate what he's been able to, to accomplish and do at uh, essentially his alma mater. Also. And then yesterday I traveled to Pier and attended the uh, property tax assessment uh, method methodology uh, meeting. This was the initial meeting of that legislative uh, group. And uh, the primary uh, person testifying yesterday was uh, our assessor, uh, uh, Shannon Ripper, uh, uh, Rittenberg, I'm sorry, uh, who basically laid out what the process is uh, in Pennington County, which I think is probably uh, similar in, in most counties. However, we have counties of various sizes, and so some things may not be accomplished the same in some counties. And I, one, of the, one of the things the committee is trying to do is to make sure that it's equalized uh, and that the process is consistent uh, throughout the state, and that's part of what this study is all about. Next meeting, I believe, will be held in August. At that time, they will ask uh, some additional counties to come in and testify as to their process. Uh, in addition, I think the Department of Education will be requested to come in since uh, they are the largest user of property taxes in the state of South Dakota. And... Uh, uh, and then they will have their uh, initially tentatively scheduled to have a meeting in September and then the final meeting, a fourth meeting in either late October or early November, I believe. So I um, did have an opportunity to uh, uh, meet with the co-chair of the, of the committee following the meeting. And, um, you know, it's, it's probably not quite as much depth on property taxes as that we as a commission would like to see, uh, since they're dealing strictly with methodology. Uh, hopefully from this though, in my opinion, I think that some, some other legislators may come up with ideas of uh, some changes that need to be made in the entire process, uh, which may be beneficial for us. And, Trying to keep a close eye on that to see what ideas come forward and make sure that uh, we as an association, if, if not as a commission, uh, we as an association have uh, input into uh, that proposal, any proposals that come forward. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Drew. And I have to say I came in the other morning and our staff was hard at work watching those meetings. So that that's a... I appreciate that. You guys are both working on streaming that, keeping up on what's happening because it is important for, for our community. Appreciate it. Mr. Raskinet. Uh, Travis reported on the 
weed and pest, and I did not make the weir, but just to expand a little bit uh, on the building committee, we did have some hard bids, and I'll just share those. Uh, relative to the 900 concourse, the hard bid number on that, 6,493,000, with a start date of July 1st, 2024. And to put that in perspective on a per square foot basis, we paid roughly $92 a square foot for that property, the 10 acres, the building, and the infrastructure. And then the uh, number I just read would equate to about $85 a square foot based on the 76,000 square foot building. So if you add those two, get a, get a rough idea what we paid for that whole property uh, repurposed into a county administration building which would be 92 plus 85, so less than $200 a square foot. The 14 St. Joe, that hard bid from Mac Construction was 446,300. And although that just uh, pertains to a certain portion of that building, uh, if you put that perspective, that's a 36,000 square foot building, so that comes out to about uh, so what we have in cost with that building for the purchase, uh, you, you can add another $12.40 a square foot to build out the public defender's area. And then with the uh, Fuller Construction, got the bid for the drainage for juvenile services build, uh, building uh, next to the highway drainage and sewer project that was 108961 uh, 60,000 uh, building and ground funding, 48,961 accumulated building funding. So just a little more detail on those three properties. Thanks, Ron. Um, I did attend the CARE Campus Advisory Board meeting. It, it was uh, very well attended. Uh, nothing new, just a lot of discussions on uh, the intakes of the people coming in and so forth. So, and the, some of the budget numbers. Um, compensation committee meeting I had yesterday. I have to admit, uh, you know, these employees and department heads in the, this commission or the compensation committee have worked really hard and diligently, uh, you know, on this assessment of, of wage studies. And I think uh, the program that they come up with is probably something uh, a lot of people would like to see us have their hands on. But they've, they've worked their due diligence on this with every department and not everything's perfect. And everybody recognizes that. Um, but there's great discussion and, and, and they're gonna try and meet with each commissioner separately to be able to go with, answer any questions because you know that's how they want to get it done beforehand so they can research and look and so forth. But uh, I have to admit that the, the teamwork for this coming together from all departments has been an amazing feat. And so I appreciate their work. Um, the MPO meeting I attended, uh, we had nine, 10 items on there. Uh, we approved the, the Highway 1416 Radar Hill Road Corridor Study, which we had that presentation in our last meeting. Uh, we also approved the county master plan before even the county did today. So that was one of the things we, we also went on to. Uh, we acknowledged the major street plan analysis and update. We also approved a resolution adopting the Rapid City area uh, metropolitan organization as a functional classification map and also approved the Rapid City Area Metropolitan Organizational Self Certification. Uh, also approved Transportation Improvement Program Draft uh, and also approved the Metropolitan Planning Organization Operational Plan Update. Um, they did have some other, they gave an update on Elk Valley Road reconstruction. To, uh, discussions and uh, what that is, Gary we, and Ron, as we talked about, we had uh, Joe and the city staff and all, and Box Elder all kind of having discussions on the 
uh, lower part of Elk Well from the truck stop to Country Road. That's been been a problem. So they're still in discussions of trying to, you know, because it's part Rapid City, part Box Elder, part Bangton County. The last we talked about it, we were trying to figure out portions and so forth. But uh, there is still discussion going on between the department head or the departments, the highway departments, and so forth. So it's been an ongoing issue. We get so far, then it gets dropped. And so, but they put it on our agenda to keep it in on our mind so we don't drop it. Uh, then they gave some update on the construction construction pro projects like the, the bridge above, you know, they got the walkway at, uh, above I-90 from Anamosa, that bridge. And uh, as we had the meeting, they said St. Pat Street was opening up, but it was not. But St. Pat between 8th Street and, and 5th Street, I seen Sod the other day. So it should be opening up, I'm sure, really quick. I think that's been a really long project. So uh, what they said part of the problem was was all the retaining walls. They did the infrastructure and all that other stuff. But if you remember right when you went down that corridor, there were some pretty tall retaining walls back then that were kind of cracked and so forth. So I think there's been, well, should be ready to go. So, um, the other thing is, is I'll have to forward you some information on the WIR Public Lands Steering Committee. Our discussions were more on resolutions uh, for the main conference next month for the WIR board. And so, a lot of them had to do, some had to do with fire, uh, wildfire funding and some other ones, but, uh, I'll get them gathered and get them sent out to the commissioners, some of those resolutions. Mr. Chair. Mr. Austin. Who's the chair and vice chair of the MPO committee this year? I'm the vice chair and Larry Larson. Larry's the chair. Okay, Larry's still the chair. Yeah. Okay. With that, we are done with that. So I'd look for a motion to go into executive session pursuant to SDCL 125.2.1 for personnel issues moved by Drews. Second. Seconded by the Cross Connect. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We got no motions or anything. Move to come out of executive session. Second. Moved and seconded to come out of executive session. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Move to adjourn. Move by, move by Laster, second by Roskamit to adjourn. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.